Okay, it is 7.01. Um, well, welcome everybody to uh, the town of, uh, Scott, are you up? Sorry. Uh, so welcome everybody. <laughs> welcome everybody to the town of Williston Development Review uh, Board uh, located here in the police uh, conference room for Tuesday, November 12th. Uh, we're going to get going at 7.01 and bring the meeting to order. Um, there are a number of items on the uh, agenda tonight. Uh, Paul did have a suggestion. Uh, about going slightly out of order. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to start, we are actually going to start with DP 17-01.2 Black Rock Construction. I'm assuming there are probably some people here who are interested in that. Um, is Ben here? No. Is anybody here? More people are probably here for the, the V-Trans. Okay. All right. So let's see if we can. Well, I just I, I said that. Is uh, did you expect anybody here from BlackRock, or is this a perfunctory? I, it's perfunctory, but I did speak to Ben Avery today and expect him to be here. But he did note when I talked to him that he was he was um, second to last on the agenda. So he may. So be he's gonna, okay. So he's going to. So all right. So maybe that won't work. Which uh, makes me concerned that maybe others. Right. So uh, we won't we won't start with that. So I think we we maybe need to go in order. Yeah. For that reason. Yeah. Uh, don't forget public comment for things not on the agenda. I have one thing I want to mention. Okay. All right. So, um, <laughs> all right. So, so much for going out of order. I guess we'll go in order. Um, uh, also going in order, we do start with a public comment. It sounds like our illustrious staff has something he wants to say. Um, just really quickly to the chair and the board, I wanted to recognize and welcome Bonnie Woodford. Bonnie is our new planning technician and joined the staff just today. Yes. This is oh, the last DRB meeting where she ever gets to stand over there and just watch. So <laughs> enjoy it. Uh, welcome to the staff and, and welcome to Willis and thank you uh, for coming. So Excellent. we are uh, back up to full strength in the office and thrilled to have her with us. So right. Great. welcome, welcome, welcome Bonnie. DRB. Um, any other, uh, any other, um, anything else the uh, uh, audience would like to br uh, bring before the board that is not on the agenda? Nope. Okay. Uh, okay. For the uh, uh, first thing tonight is DP 20-14 Adams Real Properties LLC. We're going to bring that. Uh, we're going to open up that hearing at 7:03. Mr. Adams, if you would state your name and your address, please. Jason Adams, 207 Boyer Circle. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Matt? Yes. Uh, so this is a request for a discretionary permit to establish outdoor storage on an existing parcel. Uh, I'm sorry, on an existing paved area and to install a fence at 78 and 90 Adams Drive. Um, the development collectively known as Town Park on the South Burlington Williston line. Um, the parcel is currently developed with three structures and access drive parking and other related appurtenances. Um, this is the first time the DRB is reviewing this request, and due to the scale of the project proposal, pre application review by the board was not required. So we're straight into the discretionary permit stage of review. Um, you can see a permitting history going back. Um, into 1985, the original creation of the Town Park subdivision and some more recent approvals related to uh, the addition of parking spaces on the site. So the proposed use related to the proposed outdoor storage is ABC Supply, which is a roofing supply retailer um, at the um, parcel address. Wholesale trade, which is what that is, is an allowed <coughs> use in the industrial zoning district west. There are no changes to access proposed. Adams Drive is a private road with a curb cut onto Williston Road, a state highway. Uh, there are no new buildings proposed. There is an eight-foot tall chain link fence with barbed wire and a 16-foot long sliding gate for truck access and a four-foot gate for mower access proposed to enclose the outdoor storage area. There's no new site work proposed. This area is over existing pavement. Um, in terms of nearby wetlands, waterways, and conservation areas, the Muddy Brook is the property line of this parcel on the western side, um, and there is existing wooded vegetation located in the 150-foot setback to the Muddy Brook. Um, the applicant is proposing outdoor storage. This is in compliance with the requirements of Chapter 36 of the Williston Development Bylaw, which is the Industrial Zoning District West Chapter. Um, outdoor storage is permitted in this district, but it is required to be identified on an approved site plan. We have always taken approved site plan, plan to mean approved by the Development Review Board, which is why it's in front of you for a hearing tonight. 
Um, this parcel, because it fronts on Williston Road, uh, it is in our town's design review district as well as in the industrial district. However, the design review criteria do not apply because the building um, at 731 Adams Drive obstructs the view of the outdoor storage between uh, 78 and 90 Adams Drive. So you, you can't see it um, from the uh, state highway adjacent. Uh, there are no proposed changes to lighting, landscaping, setbacks, street trees, parking traffic, utilities, water and wastewater, or stormwater on this site. We did not receive any public comment on this application at the point where we mailed out the package to you, nor have we received any sense. We did circulate these plans for comment from the Police, Fire, and Public Works Department. Um, we did not receive comment back from Police and Fire. Public Works did provide a comment memo, which is attached to your report. Uh, asking for identification of all utilities and a, a calculation of the amount of impervious surface on the site. Um, staff is recommending approval of this discretionary permit with findings of fact, conclusions of law, and conditions of approval as stated below the staff report. Um, you'll note that these conditions of approval are all essentially boilerplate uh, with the minor exception that the public works memo and date is referenced as a condition of approval. And I will stop there. Jason, what do you want to add? Sums it up. Um, just for your, based on those public works comments, <clears throat> this fence is not increasing impervious surfaces, but the total impervious uh, is about 47%, which leaves about 53% green space. That's all existing now. There's no change to that. And um, you'll tell that you'll tell that to DPW. Yeah, well, I'll add that to a site plan and submit a new one. And uh, if you guys are wondering, there is a gas line that runs basically along the uh, east or right side of 90 Adams Drive to the back of the building, where one meter serves the back half of that building. That's really the only utility that'll be not affected by this, but in kind of the way of this. But we'll obviously dig safe it and, and miss those utilities, hopefully. Okay. Barbed wire. Yeah, these uh, national companies, I find that their security standards are not really uh, honed in for our area. They have concerns in other parts of the country, and they kind of just have a standard. Questions from the board? Just it, it will be just the two sections of fence added, the one in the front and the one in the back? Or is it uh, yep, the one along basically going right across from 78 Adams across the pavement to 90 Adams Drive. And then there is a little piece of fence in the back. Um, so behind the 90 Adams Drive building, it drops off pretty steep to Muddy Brook. And um, basically right before the property line, it drops off pretty good in the back. So this is just a little deterrent. You would have to have, have a pretty motivated person to uh, even go behind. I don't know how they would get behind that. ATVs, I guess. I don't know. But they wanted just a little piece to deter that even further. Um, so if there won't be a gate or anything there. It's just basically from the building to where it drops off as another deterrent. Um, primarily shingles uh, on, on pallets in bundles um, and, and potentially some other building materials. That's all they sell. Um, just from the smaller outdoor storage areas they have now, I, I, they've never stored siding or anything like that. It's always been shingles. Um, so primarily shingles, possibly other building materials. Just make sure you get with the, <coughs> the fire department to let them know that gate will be probably locked after hours, right? Yes, that'll So be they'll locked. probably either ask you for a key or put it in the lockbox. Yeah, we'll put a lock we'll weld the lockbox around the post there. Okay. Yeah. So I'm trying to you've got three or four different areas here you've designated for outdoor storage? Yeah. I mean, it's not everything behind the fence. It's just the areas that you've indicated that are either hatched and says proposed outdoor storage. Yeah, the hashed area is the, is the new outdoor storage. Um, the space that's kind of triangular shaped behind 78 Adams Drive was approved, I think, in 2012-ish. Um, and then 
there was existing outdoor storage in front of 90 Adams Drive. <clears throat> so the only, so the new fence kind of encloses, uh, there was another tenant in 90 Adams Drive. They've moved out. ABC Supply is taking that over as well as 78. So now they, they're the only person who needs access to the paved area between the two buildings. So they want to secure that. So basically so they can use it for themselves and then and that other small rectangular area oh yeah um that's i don't know when that was approved but it's been there for a long okay. and that's going to stay it'll stay so there's three existing yes. areas that are staying and you're adding this one other area that's that's approved yeah or you're requesting that it be approved right i'm good everybody else set any questions from the audience? Jason, anything else you want to add? Anything else you'd like to add? Nope. Thank you for coming. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, we're going to close DP 20 14 at 712. Okay, next up is uh, pre-application for DP 20-15, the Mazuzan subdivision. And we're going to open the hearing at 712. Gentlemen, welcome. Hello. Names and addresses, please. Kevin Mazuzan, 1120 Butternut Road. Jesse Lauer, 1120 Butternut Road. Great. Melinda, this you? Yes. This is a request for pre-application review of a two-lot subdivision of a 5.27-acre parcel located at 1120 Butternut Road in the Rural Residential Zoning District. Melinda, can you speak up just a bit? You barely hear you. The property is currently developed with a single-family dwelling and access driveway. The proposed residential development will add one dwelling unit to the site for a total of two dwelling units. This is pre-application um, stage of review, um, which is a concept level review. Um, this is presented in an informal way that invites comment and discussion of alternatives. This is the first time the DRB has reviewed a proposal for a subdivision on this parcel. The subject parcel has existed uh, since there is one existing single-family dwelling on the parcel, and the applicant is proposing one additional single-family dwelling. Residential uses are allowed in the ARZD. Um, Williston Development Bylaw Chapter 19 um, density does require that lands with wetlands, wetland buffers, and slopes in excess of 30% be taken out of the density calculation and that lands with slopes between 15 and 29.9 percent be calculated at a reduced density of one dwelling unit per 10 <coughs> acres. Um, there are no state mapped wetlands or wetland advisory areas on the subject parcel. The applicant's engineer conducted a site visit and concluded there are no existing wetlands on the property. A wetland assessment or and or delineation has not been performed. Um, based on the information provided, staff did a constraints analysis that I provided in the table below. Um, so there are approximately 1.22 acres of slopes between 15 and 29.9 percent, and there are no wetlands and no slopes greater than um, 30 percent. There are 4.05 acres of unconstrained land, um, leading, yielding um, a allowable density of 2.33 dwelling units, rounding down. Uh, that's two dwelling units. The applicant is proposing two units, including the existing one. Um, this project is not subject to the requirements of setting aside open space because the parent parcel is less than 10.5 acres. Um, the project 
proposed project meets minimum lot size requirements and medium minimum um, lot furniture requirements. Um, staff is not recommending a traffic study for this project. Administrative permits for a new single family dwelling include a transportation impact fee. A new um, shared driveway is proposed for lot one and two. Um, the applicant is proposing to relocate their existing <coughs> driveway approximately um, 162 feet northeast along Butternut Road. Um, a 30 foot wide easement will be provided across lot one to access lot two. Um, the existing driveway will be removed, but um, there's a right of way on that driveway for the Howard subdivision and that will remain. Um, the establishment of a new driveway will require an access permit issued by the Williston Department of Public Works. Um, for landscaping and setbacks, um, a side and rear setback of 15 feet has been applied to lot two for future development boundaries. Staff recommends that existing vegetation should be retained to the greatest extent feasible. Um, there is a, an existing on-site water, water and wastewater and um, the proposed new dwelling will have uh, uh, on-site wastewater as well. Um, the applicant's engineer concludes that um, the land can support uh, an additional wastewater system and system design and state permits are not required at the pre-application <coughs> review phase. A water and wastewater permit will be required for an administrative permit to construct a new dwelling. The existing home has a 50 foot underground connection to the existing above ground power uh, located on the second of two existing poles on the parcel. The proposed unit will also have an underground connection to the first existing pole on the parcel. For um, water, uh, waterways and wetlands and conservation areas, there are, no, there are no state map class two wetlands on the subject parcel um, and a site investigation uh, determined there are no wetlands present on the property. The parcel is within a significant wildlife habitat area and uh, habitat disturbance assessment um, will be required at the discretionary permit review stage. The project area is within secondary foreground viewshed area as identified in the visual assessment official map. Um, WDB 27.9 directs the DRB to consider viewshed impacts to this viewshed and apply conditions of approval to mitigate those impacts as part of the review of this project. For trail easements, there are no desired primitive trails shown on the property um, on map 17 of the Williston Comprehensive Plan and the applicant has not proposed a public trail easement as part of this project. For growth management, um, WDB 11.2.2.1 states that one dwelling may be constructed on any undeveloped parcel that was and has continued to be in separate ownership since um, 1990, which was when the, when the town adopted its first, first growth management system. There's no record of subdivision of the, of the subject parcel since 1990, and thus the growth management exemption applies. The applicant retains the right for one dwelling unit, and if so authorized, will proceed with a residential growth management allocation request for one additional dwelling unit. Residential growth management allocation is a competitive process um, to obtain residential growth management allocation without obtaining an, an, an exemption. A project must receive a minimum score of 30 points. Project will be scored using the evaluation criteria for proposed residential subdivisions outside the sewer service area. More information about growth management can be found in WDB Chapter 11. Um, staff can provide guidance to applicants who have questions about the growth management criteria. Um, no comment letters from the public were received by the Planning and Zoning Office at the time of the mail out on November 7th. Um, the police did not respond to our request for comments. Um, the Department of Public Works uh, has no comments at this time, and the fire department stated that they have no requests um, at this time, 
but may have some requirements if the project moves forward for to discretionary permit stage. The applicant is encouraged to meet with the Department of Public Works and the Fire Department prior to submitting the application for discretionary permit so that they understand what the requirements are. The Conservation Commission um, reviewed this application and made two recommendations. One, that uh, a habitat disturbance assessment should be conducted and submitted as part of a discretionary permit application. And the second, that um, the application for discretionary permit be accompanied by a, a completed runoff and erosion control checklist. Um, and that, uh, yeah, so staff is recommending that the DRB authorize DP 2015 to proceed to growth management review in March 2020 with some recommendations for you to consider. Great, thanks a bunch. Um, back on number nine, page three, <clears throat> can you, can you tell me what, what exactly is a performance-based mound-type wastewater system? <laughs> Not something I have run across before. You want to answer that? It's, it's the language that uh, the uh, that TCE used in, in uh, okay. describing the type of So you don't know, you don't know either? <laughs> yep, I don't know. Okay, great. Right. Yep. <laughs> Anybody know? Last one. <laughs> what is it? What is it? <laughs> what is it? <laughs> Following the rules, can you state your name? You don't need to stand up. Zoli Horvath, I am a site technician designing septic systems. Um, performance based are when you cannot quite meet the rules and there's some allowances that you can do a like a desktop hydro study to make sure you have separation from the groundwater depth and maintain that. Um, so. Okay. So in other words it gives you it gives you a little wiggle room. Okay. And is a press B system included in that? <clears throat> it could be, yes. Okay. That's a gravity fed system. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kevin, what would you, Kevin and Jesse, what would you like to add to that uh, synopsis? Since you brought up the performance based mound type wastewater system, <laughs> we are uh, we're also proposing to, and, and I believe that this is also the state is requiring us to, because there's an existing dwelling that has a traditional um, leach field, to design a backup system for that. So that will be um, designed in case that should fail on the existing uh, dwelling. Uh, and, and it will be the same type of system for the new dwelling as well. And we're proposing, because of the slope of the land, uh, the Presby systems, which are um, gravity-fed systems. So would the replacement system be on the lot that you're going to be retaining, or would it be on the... Just, just be, if it's on the lot that, that I would be retrain, retaining for the existing home, yes, it would be on that. Okay. Yep. <coughs> would they, are they going to require a, the proposed system and a backup system? On the new lot as no, well? No, just, just the, the proposed system. Okay. And we did, um, uh, our engineer invited the state to join us for uh, the soil testing, so she was on site um, and concurred with all of his findings as well. I, I understand this is st still pre-application process, so uh, we didn't dive too deep into it. We haven't designed it yet, just to see if we could, in fact, do it. Um, and then additionally, uh, prior to the letters going out to all of our budding neighbors um, uh, notifying them of this hearing, we took steps to, to go and speak to each one of our uh, neighbors that abut the property and the owners across the street from the property just um, in this conceptual stage to have that conversation now about what it's going to look like in order to ask for their feedback and their insight, uh, their concerns. Um, we spoke face to face with everybody except for one of our new neighbors that we've not had the opportunity to speak to, but we did reach out to them as well. So, um, not that we've gotten everybody's blessing, we haven't gotten a lot of negative feedback as well, uh, but we have invited folks to uh, participate in the process with us. Uh, Jesse describes this as a really uh, nice. Yeah, it's a little microcosm. It's, uh, Butternut's its own little community, so the more that we can include them and keep them uh, in the loop on what we're doing, uh, the more in the spirit of Butternut Road, I feel it, we feel it is. Okay. Paul? 
Kevin, so yes. uh, with this now uh, split driveway, if your new neighbor decides that he's working at 5 in the morning, uh, are you guys getting up to plow that section for him so he can get out in the winter? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that we'll have some sort of agreement in place, but uh, I maintain the driveway now, and, and I'll probably continue to maintain it. And I was, I was up <laughs> this really morning. early this morning. I was up this morning. So, yeah. <laughs> and I'm a pastry chef. I'm already out the door to work at 5 in the morning. So, <laughs> so he has to. Yeah, he's first track. <laughs> Uh, the idea also to to move the existing driveway was a conversation we've already had with um, uh, with Bill uh, about moving that driveway because it's really in a tough spot on the corner of Butternut or there's a turn there at the top of the hill um, with the Halloween storm the the culvert failed again and all of the water took out part of the road so we prior to us even considering this we had that conversation about moving the driveway further. <coughs> Um, along Butternut Road, um, it'll be safer and uh, cost less to maintain it. Um, so we'll, we'll c I even if we don't move forward with this project, we'll move forward with moving the driveway. Um, but maintaining the um, uh, the right of way for uh, Gary Howard, um, and you'll be happy to know that we had a nice sit down with Gary and Sue. I figured Howard. you probably did because he's not here. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> what I thought. <laughs> Yeah. Tell me about that. It just kind of stops right there. Yeah, so that's the last pole on Butternut Road is, is the one that feeds my house. Um, so they're very excited about us considering burying the two poles that are um, on the property, and that's what we, we would like to do is uh, there's one pole that would um, feed the new dwelling, and then we would go underground from that pole to our current dwelling, which right now is another pole. So we would be removing yet another. That, that easement would then be reduced. Um, so we had the conversation with them about that, and they were really kind of excited about not having to maintain yet another pole at the end of the line. Okay. Other questions from the board? No. 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 One last question. Yeah, Paul. One other question. Uh, the comment where it said, said about doing the wildlife study, mm -hmm. you're good with that, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that is you know, <coughs> that new driveway. Yeah. When you finally decide what you're doing, the fire department's going to tell you what they have to, you know, the load of the engine you have to support. That's all they're going to give you to have up on. Yeah, well, right now they currently can't make it up to the dwelling. Yeah. <laughs> so I'd like for them to be able to make it up there. <laughs> Right now they have to hike up there. So I'm just saying that's the feedback yeah. they're probably going to give you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And we'll um, <laughs> we'll do everything we can to make sure we can get the apparatus up there. Sounds good. A quick question for staff on the trail easement: Is there any value there? Is there any connectivity close by? Is there any no, reason why we would want to capture? No, not in this case. Their um, their parcel is really small to begin with, and it's very close to the um, the Howard parcel that uh, was subdivided last year, in which their um, the town did obtain a trail easement. So the conservation commission didn't see any value in in an additional trail. Easement. Did you put this package together, or did TCE? Uh, and, uh, I worked on it primarily, but <coughs> TCE. You get, you're, you get nominated for Homeowner Package of the Year. <laughs> <laughs> it's very good. Uh, thank you. I, I would second that. I, I can't take all the credit. We, we utilize the services of TCE. Take it. Take it. <laughs> Just accept it. <laughs> Any questions from the audience? Comments? Questions? Anybody want to say anything? We're missing Mr. Howard. Okay. <laughs> Any, anything else from the uh, anything else from the board? No, thank you. No, we'll see. We'll get. We'll get. Yeah, we'll have to talk with these guys here in a couple of uh, weeks or months for this. Project. Hopefully, we'll see you in in March. March. Okay. March. Yeah. So you you I, I do suggest you get with the uh, the staff on uh, the growth management um, process. Okay. Thank you. A single lot subdivision there it is it's not easy to get through yeah okay all right um anything else anything from the audience board's fine 
Okay, we're going to close DP 20 15, Mazuzan subdivision at 731. Thank you. Thank you for coming. <clears throat> okay, next up is uh, DP 20 16, Jennifer and Way? Wee. Oui. Oui. Almost. Tran. Uh, so this is a first in 12 or 13 years of sitting on this board, having never seen a variance before, or a request for a variance. Uh, so uh, name and address, please. Evan Fitzgerald, Fitzgerald Environmental, 18 Severn Screen, Colchester, Vermont. All right. Matt? Uh, Melinda's got this. Melinda, all right. This is a request for a variance to allow a reduction of the front yard a setback and a reduction of the watershed protection buffer for the purposes of constructing a proposed wastewater system for a three bedroom single family home with accessory apartment at 555 Oak Hill Road in the agricultural rural residential zone. The subject pro property is approximately 64.1 acres in size and is currently undeveloped. Subject parcel has existed since before 1990 and the property has not been developed. This is the first time the DRB has reviewed this proposal. This is a request for a variance from the required 50 foot watershed protection buffer for class two wetlands and the required 50 foot street setback. The applicant proposes to construct a wastewater system for a three bedroom single family home with accessory apartment on the subject property the variance is being requested to allow a reduction of the street setback from 50 feet to 13 feet and to allow a reduction of the wetland buffer from 50 feet to 8 feet. Um, so there are two primary setbacks that potentially affect the development potential of the subject property. The first being the, the 50 foot watershed protection buffer for wetlands and the second is the required 50 foot setback from Oak Hill Road. The combined effect of these two required setbacks um, means that there's virtually no area on the subject property that can be developed in strict conformance with the town's development regulations. The subject property has not yet been developed and would otherwise be undevelopable without the granting of a variance. Um, so in the, in the consideration of, of granting a variance as required by um, Vermont statute 44 69, there are five specific requirements or tests of the law that the request must meet in order for the DRB to grant the request. Um, these are spelled out in a Wilston Development Bylaw Chapter 8, and it should be also be pointed out that all five of these criteria must be met in order for the variance to be granted, not simply a majority of the five. Based on the information presented and a review of the applicable development requirements and standards, staff has, pre has prepared a discussion of the applicant's request against the five variance <coughs> criteria. And I'll go through them. Um, the first is there are unique physical circumstances or conditions, including irregularity, narrowness, or shallowness, shallowness of the lot size or shape, or exceptional topographical or other physical conditions peculiar to the particular property and that unnecessary hardship is due to these conditions and not the circumstances or conditions generally created by the provisions of this bylaw in the neighborhood or district in which the property is located. So essentially, what we're dealing with is that the class two wetlands cover the vast majority of the 64 acre parcel. Um, class two wetlands and their associated buffers are protected by state statute and the Williston Development Bylaw, chapter 29. There are two areas accessible from town roads that are suitable for development and wastewater disposal outside of class two wetlands and their 50 foot buffers. Uh, the first is a one acre area along South Road um, and the second is a two acre area along Oak Hill Road. Um, so each of these two areas would require a variance as it turns out because the area along South Road, also um, the wastewater would encroach into the 150 foot setback of I-89. Um, the site along Oak Hill Road, um, the uh, wastewater system encroaches into the 
front yard into the um, 50 foot setback of Oak Hill Road and the, the wetland buffer. Um, so the location that is along South Road would actually result in much greater impact to the wetlands um, because a force main would be necessary to get the water from the proposed house location on Oak Hill Road and get it um, over. It would have to pass under or through uh, wetlands on the parcel and, and would cause approximately 5,000 square feet of impact if that was the, the um, proposed location. Um, so the location off of Oak Hill Road uh, would, would still require a variance but would cause less impact to wetlands. Um, so in summary, because the, these unique physical circumstances are present, wetlands cover all but a small portion of the property and the hardship is due to these conditions, um, staff is recommending that this criterion for a variance has been met by the applicant. Um, the next criteria, because of these physical circumstances or conditions, there's no possibility that the property can be developed in strict conformity with the provisions of this bylaw and that the authorization of a variance is therefore necessary to enable the reasonable use of the property. <coughs> so both the state and the town's restrictions on class two wetland and buffer impacts um, precludes the use of a force main traversing the property from South Road to Oak Hill Road and effectively forces the owner to site the dwelling and wastewater disposal area within close proximity. The limited space along South Road for both a dwelling and a wastewater system due to wetland and road setbacks makes the area along Oak Hill Road the only practical solution for a single family home. Um, additionally, the previous wastewater system along South Road um, also does not conform to the town's 150 foot setback requirement and in itself would require a variance. Um, so essentially the <coughs> Wastewater, proposed wastewater system is uh, located um, where it has to be located um, in order to work. Um, it's oriented in, in a direction it needs to be in order to function. Um, and it still would encroach on uh, the wetland buffer and the Oak Hill Road right, right of way. Um, and, the, and the location of the mound system along Oak Hill Road is the only location with suitable soils. So the property is currently not developed. The applicant wishes to develop it with a three bedroom single family home and accessory apartment. Staff recommends the DRB consider this scale of development to be a reasonable use of the property because it is similar in scale to typical residential uses in Williston. Accessory dwellings are allowed under the bylaw. In fact, are required by state statute to be a permitted use. Such development is not possible in strict conformity with the bylaw, therefore variance is necessary. Staff is recommending that the criterion, um, this criterion under WDB 8132 for variance has been met by the applicant. Um, so moving on to the next criteria, um, the unnecessary hardship has not been created by the appellant or his, her predecessors in interest. The unnecessary hardship the owner has faced in building one single family home on a 64 acre parcel is a function of the natural site constraints and DEC permitting restrictions for wetlands. The hardship has not been created due to prior subdivision of the lot by the owner or past owners or by any other action taken by the current owner. Staff recommends that this criterion for variance has been met by the applicant. Um, the fourth criteria is the variance, if authorized, will not alter the essential character of the neighborhood or district in which the property is located, substantially or permanently impair the appropriate use or development of an adjacent property, reduce access to renewable energy resources, or be detrimental to the public welfare. Um, the proposed wastewater mound, um, which would, th that's the, what would encroach on the, on the setbacks, not a house. It would be a wastewater system. Um, it will not present, represent a significant departure from other mode and landscaped areas along the Oak Hill Road right of way, um, including the Thomas Chitton and Health Center immediately across from the proposed house and mound system. 
as well as other nearby single-family residences with lawns adjacent to Oak Hill Road. Uh, the proposed wastewater mound will not impair the appropriate use or development of adjacent property, reduce access to energy resources, or be detrimental to the public welfare. Um, in accordance with Vermont DEC wetlands permit and the Williston Conservation Commission recommendations, the permitted edge of the wetland buffer disturbance is proposed to be demarcated with permanent markers, fencing or boulders, to prevent further encroachment on the wetland. Um, the Vermont DEC wetland permit decision states that the, that the proposed wetland buffer use will not cause undue adverse effects on the protected functions and values of the significant wetland and associated buffer zone, and the Conservation Commission uh, concurs with this finding. Staff is recommending that this criterion for variance has been met by the applicant. And the final criteria, the variance, if authorized, will represent the minimum variance that will afford relief and will represent the least deviation possible from the bylaw and the town plan. Um, so the current design of the wastewater uh, disposal area um, eliminates direct impacts to class two wetlands um, and results in uh, the minimum amount of wetland buffer impact um, in comparison to the previously designed wastewater system, which would have resulted in much greater impacts to wetlands and wetland buffers and would have encroached on another town uh, road setback. Um, so the Vermont DEC wetland permit, um, which was issued in August of 2019, allows this impact to the buffer and recognizes that the impacts to the significant wetlands and buffer have been minimized to the greatest extent possible. So the variance request um, to reduce the street and wetland setbacks is for a wastewater mound system, not a dwelling or other structure. The request is the minimum variance that will allow for a single family dwelling given the site constraints and alternatives analysis completed on the property to minimize impacts to natural resources. Additionally, the requested reduction of wetland buffer has been approved by the Vermont DEC and therefore given a determination of minimal impact on significant wetland functions and values. <coughs> Staff is recommending that this criterion for a variance has been met by the applicant. Um, the Conservation Commission uh, reviewed this project and um, had a uh, few recommendations. Um, Basically, number one, because the variance request meets the necessary criteria, the town should grant a variance uh, for the proposed reduction in setbacks. Um, the, their second recommendation uh, is to demarcate the wetland on the site plan and permanently on the ground, and that mowing in the water, this third recommendation was that mowing in the watershed protection buffer uh, shall be limited to what is minimally required for the maintenance of the wastewater system. The police department and fire department and department of public works had no comments, um, except that uh, the public works stated uh, our ROW permit will be required um, for the new driveway access and the driveway culvert shall be appropriately sized. Um, staff is recommending the DRB accept and adopt the following <coughs> findings of fact and conclusions of law in rendering its decision. Great, thank you very much. Uh, could you? Clarify one item for me. Um, on, uh, on page three, um, regarding the accessory dwelling. So the fact that the accessory dwelling is a permitted use allows it to supersede the requirement for a variance? No. Um that what I get out. That's what, that's, how, that's what I read. Okay. So it would seem to me that it would seem to me that because it's a variance, we would look for the we would look for the minimum amount of encroachment possible. Adding a adding a accessory dwelling increases the size of the mound system. Consequently, increases the encroachment. Why is that allowed if we are trying to minimally impact the um, wetlands? Because um, this is allowing a reasonable use of the property, and um, it's you know it's similar it's similar in scale to other 
residential uses in, in, that are permitted in Wollaston, <coughs> including accessory dwellings. Um, okay. I think, Scott, if I might ask that same question of the applicant in a different way. Please do. If, if this, if your proposal and and you are you, you're not the applicant. You you are not the applicant. Yeah, representing right? the applicant. You're representing the applicant. Okay, so if they were to propose, <coughs> let's say, a two-bedroom dwelling or a or, I presume that the accessory apartment is at least one bedroom. How? Right. Is it one bedroom? It or is one. It's one. So they've so they've gotten approved a four-bedroom system. Effectively. Yes. Okay, so. Would a smaller system or would a system that was uh, designed for three or two bedrooms encroach less it would into the setback? It would encroach less, but there would still be a setback uh, relief requirement in both the wetland buffer and the front yard, according to our calculations. So how much less for, say, a two-bedroom how much less for a three bedroom than a four bedroom? Uh, I'm not sure I know the answer to all three of those scenarios, but uh, for example, a, um, a four bedroom apartment would um, require about 10 feet less, 10 to 15 feet less of the of length of the mound system. A four bed or a three bed? A three bed. So, so you have four. four. No, have I do. Proposed. A four bed is what you have proposed, right? Four bedroom. That's correct. Well, it's three bedroom and an accessory apartment. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so is there a distinction between a four bedroom and a three bedroom yes. accessory? Okay. Yes. So then, okay, so what would a three bedroom without an accessory apartment have? Do um, you know the size? Of the I don't have those calculations right in front of me, but um, a three bedroom, I can do some quick math to give you a, a sense. And while you're doing the math, I'm going to ask Matt a question. Mm -hmm. <coughs> is, this, is this a right of the applicant? to have an accessory dwelling? Is that what, that what I'm reading in, in the analysis, in the staff notes? So what statute says <clears throat> is that wherever you permit single-family homes to be constructed, a single-family home can add an accessory dwelling unit if it can meet all of the development standards. So um, you are, you're out on a little bit of the fuzzy edge here. What you're really determining as a board is what is what is the minimum variance necessary for the reasonable use of this piece of property we have 64 acres in the ag rural zoning district where the typical house is a three plus bedroom house many of the houses in the ag rural district are are houses of a scale that includes an accessory apartment like this so what the staff has proposed is that what the applicant wants to do is close enough, if not pretty much the typical ag rural Williston house, um, and that if you were to continue to reduce the size of that house as measured by its bedroom count, at some point if you were saying, well, fine, you can develop these 60, 64 acres, you can have a one-bedroom house, you would, you would really be probably falling on the side of having taken all um, acceptable use of that piece of land. So one thing for the board to be thinking about is, for this particular case, what's the, um, what's the typical, reasonable sort of residential development that happens on, on large lots in rural Williston? And so what the applicant's asking for, what the staff is supporting, is a three-bedroom house with, with an accessory apartment. Um, understanding that um, those accessory apartments are supported strongly in state law, in the town plan, and, and in other places, they tend to uh, create very little additional impact, but we do understand that they do have an impact on the number of square feet of septic system, leach field, that's going to end up in either the street setback to Oak Hill Road or the 50-foot setback to this watershed protection buffer. Okay. All right. So I would say there's a spectrum there. At, at some point, if somebody, wanted, um, if somebody wanted two dwelling units, the answer would be no. 
that's, that's more than you get. If somebody, uh, if the board wanted to limit somebody to a one bedroom house, I would probably say you've, you've taken it too far. And somewhere in between multiple dwelling units, um, which an accessory dwelling unit is not understood as a separate dwelling unit in, in our rules or the states, somewhere between that upper limit and that lower limit is a measure of the reasonableness of what they want against um, the ability of the board to grant a variance. Okay. Jill, you want to continue to follow up with that? Have you done the math? Yes, I have. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, so there are two 50-foot setbacks that this uh, mound system is wedged between. We're asking for a reduction from 50 to 13 feet on one <coughs> side and 50 to 8 feet on the other side. Those reductions combined are about 80 feet, 79 feet. If we were, um, if it were a three bedroom home, um, the mound system would be 30 feet less length, approximately. This is scaling uh, on the fly here with some math and scaling. It should be about, uh, about that. Um, so either way, uh, even with 30 feet less length in the mound, we're still wedged in this spot where it has to go and we're still back asking you for um, relief from both setbacks in the wetland buffer and the road um, if it were now to be clear a three bedroom with accessory is 560 ga <coughs> gallons per day um, treatment uh, that's about 140 feet in length of the mound system if it were a four bedroom, it's actually less. It's 420 uh, gallons per day. I'm sorry, uh, 490. And the length would be reduced by about 15 feet. Um, so if it was a four bedroom, it would actually still encroach less than a three bedroom plus an accessory. Slightly less. However, it would still be, again, in, the, in both setbacks. So. Um, in the, in just so I understand the <coughs> assumption on the accessory dwelling causing more gallons per day is simply because it's another bathroom, it's a kitchen, it's a any of the other uh, any yeah, of the other that's right items that a household would be using as yeah. opposed to simply a bedroom. Yeah, I, it, have you considered? Well, I don't even know if it's an option. Uh, I know in other states they allow you to gray water off the washer dryer. So it does not go through the mound system. It goes into those, <coughs> you know, those basically the plastic cans <coughs> and the rock. Right. We don't do that. We don't do that. California does that, and right. And other. Okay. other yeah. We don't do. We don't do that. I mean, I, I didn't know for sure. Never can tell in Vermont. <laughs> so I mean, I I just want you to be aware too. We we have state confines, state permitting confines, uh, that we're working within. You know, in addition to town, you know, getting to that question. And, I hope it was evident in um, Melinda's summary that we had to coordinate extensively with uh, DEC wetlands on this. In fact, a bit of history, um, I don't know if I can bring this up, but uh, this is the, um, basically the same plan that you have, just a bit bigger. Um, the original mound system that was approved out here, you know, this is where we're talking about the current um, home and accessory dwelling and wastewater mound here. The original mound that was approved out here, um, the plan said um, no wetlands within 500 feet of either the mound or the, um, the home here, and that was misleading and obviously incorrect. So the alternative analysis that we had to walk through with DEC basically, ju just like um, you know, essentially the process with the town pushed us into this spot. Um, so, Question. Yes. Based on the previous uh, applicant that just came through here, where would be where would your alternative mound go if that fails? Just out of curiosity, is there any place it can go, or do you end up having to go and drive a uh, a line across the wetlands to get over to the other? No, it, the it would likely go somewhere in this vicinity. Um, and so it would go in the same place that it failed. Um, uh, or in somewhere, what I'm saying is somewhere along um, the, in this area along Oak Hill Road where the, where the soils are sitting. Is that part of the permit of replacement system? No, it's not. It's not required. 
Did you play around with configurations of a home site well and septic up in that northern area? We did. Um, and the other um, part of the story there is um, that when Interstate 89 was constructed, um, there were actually some good soils in that part of the <coughs> property, but they were all stripped away. Um, I question whether that originally uh, approved mound is, um, would be adequate, or we, our office did, um, based on the soils that we saw out there. And in addition, um, we had some, uh, the discussions that we had with DEC wetlands really pushed us away from this area. They're not comfortable with this wetland delineation, to be totally honest. Um, if we were going to propose anything um, out there, I think we would have been back out looking at that area a lot more carefully because the soils are very challenging with, given the history of the disturbance. Um, and yeah, so that, that site is um, not only just confined space-wise, but um, and with the 150-foot the setback from um, 89, but also has other environmental challenges with uh, DEC wetlands. So, but they've they've signed off on this class two. They have. They've issued a permit for. In fact, that's that's what I'm trying to explain. They sort of pushed us in this direction. You know, first of all, we came to them and said, <coughs> you know, we want to consider this original approved mound. Can you know? Would you? Um, issue a permit for a forest man to, to traverse the wetland. And they said, no, that's more than acceptable impact. Please, uh, please look at the, the area along Oak Hill Road where the dwelling is proposed. And that's, that's where we went. And then we had to go back and forth and, and um, basically find an acceptable alternative for both DEC and um, wastewater. And that was it. Do the soils vary as you go downslope from the proposed house site? <coughs> Uh, they do a bit, um, but more than anything, the slope varies um, just enough, which is um, another factor in, in the wastewater calculation. So, um, so can you just discuss for a moment the, how you ar arrived at the exact location within this stretch of space along Oak Hill Road of yeah. why the, the septic field is being proposed where it is? Well, you can kind of see on the, on the plan, there are two areas where the wetland boundary provides a bit more width um, from Oak Hill Road. And um, in this, in, we first looked at the widest area, um, which is sort of in the middle of the the upland along the swath, and the soils and the slopes um, were not quite adequate there. Um, and, um, and that's why we, we ended up um, the farthest down here um, at the other wide area. I mean, it seems like it's important that you, uh, that the, 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 the width of this septic field is, is essentially parallel with the <coughs> contour line. It, yes. So, yeah. And, and I, you know, I, I look and the, the distance between 612 and 6614 looks to be about exactly the same as between 620 and 622, which would allow you to put that essentially <coughs> exactly in the widest part of the area that's not a wetland. Yeah, yeah the soils there were um, not quite as good as, as they were down below. Are they <laughs> adequate? Um, no, I believe our, our test pits um, suggested that they weren't adequate, yeah. It's a, um, this area is really densely overgrown with brushy. Um, we, we did a lot of hand, soil hand augering all up and down that swath. Um, and, you know, without getting a machine in there, really disturbing the whole area. questions from the board um, the use of the accessory unit is it for family member or for rental unit <coughs> um, I, I don't know the uh, yeah. Jennifer yeah. just uh, family because uh, I want to do that because someday when I retire I can leave left off my, my son for, for full job. Mm -hmm. 
you are you are Jennifer. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And just to be clear, we we do not regulate accessory apartments based on who rents them. Uh, we only require that the owner be an occupant of either the primary or the accessory unit on the property. Other, <clears throat> other questions from the board? I'm a little curious about J Jennifer and her husband's ownership and how they, how long they've owned the property. I'm not sure it's necessarily appropriate for, uh, for me to know this, but I, I'm just curious, was it marketed as a as a lot suitable for development and, and perhaps they bought it under some kind of uh, pretense that one well, I'm, I'm Patrick her uh, fiance okay her son purchased it because he loves nature and planning that's what he originally purchased it for and her son's gonna live in the future wanted to live with her they grow a lot of flowers gardening and stuff like that that was the purpose originally her son purchased it yeah. and and she's here representing him and they all still live in the same house in Colchester and in the future they want to move to a place that has more greenery and more nature because her whole yard has like 10,000 plants in it <laughs> so she's really into planning and gardens and stuff. Was it represented to you that this was a lot that was developable? I'm not sure. You'd have to talk to Lee when you purchased it, her son, who's uh, about 27, 28 years old. So I can illuminate a little bit of that. Yeah, yeah so yes, more can about I? That. <laughs> so we've, we've understood in our staff um, for a very long time that this prior system was permitted. I don't know if you have the, the year at which that earlier system was permitted. It was uh, 2013. Okay. Yeah. So uh, for a significant amount of time that this property was on the market, we saw it as, um, yep, there's a DEC permitted septic system on this site. Most of the questions we honestly fielded from potential buyers were about subdivision, to which we gave them the standard, you take your ride at the DRB sort of answer and, and you don't really have a design for that. Um, but we would understand that under under most circumstances, if the, if the lot is not a total and complete swamp and that parcel has existed unsubdivided since prior to 1990, the bylaw says you, you get to put a house on it. And so then when, when this came to light that number one, that system was not going to be um, an alternative, and number two, that both that system and this one had issues with setbacks, that's when we entered into the conversation about variance. And to provide one more piece of little bit broader context, um, we do not normally engage in a whole lot of regulation of the design of septic systems because that is handled by the state of Vermont under a whole separate jurisdiction. And the only reason we're here <coughs> talking about this as a variance tonight is because within that rulemaking authority um, under the law that took jurisdiction of wastewater systems mostly away from towns unless they chose to take it back, which we have not, under that rulemaking authority, it said, if a town has a place where no development at all is allowed, <coughs> you may also preclude septic systems from those areas. So we, as a staff and in consultation with our attorney, interpreted these setbacks as areas in which no development is allowed. <coughs> um, the only development allowed in these setbacks is when you cross them with a utility, essentially, or a driveway or access. So we're, we're kind of quite a ways out on a limb discussing a variance for a septic system in a setback already, but our attorney assured us that, that we're not so far the branch is going to break. Um, that, that said, it's, it's a really, really unique case. Um, if we were talking about whether or not this house could be built in the setbacks, we would generally say, you know, maybe you got to build a house that's a funny shape, but you got to stay in those setbacks. And we had a case like that uh, under some prior rules at Lake Iroquois. In this case, it's, it's the necessary utilities to serve the house, and they intrude on these things. And almost all of the jurisdiction over the way those utilities are designed and placed is actually not in the town's wheelhouse. Matt, is this, gonna, is this lot sort of like what happened in South Burlington across the muddy from me? It had, like, you know, 40 acres and they only had like 
four one acre areas they can actually put a house on before that the whole thing got sold to the airport uh, yes, referring to the Auckler property that was was protected, and um, there there are large acreage parcels that are really highly constrained like no, this. What, what I'm saying is on this one, is there is there going to potentially have to be markers all over the place that the homeowner literally can't go outside of with his lawnmower? Uh, n n no, but we would we would understand that building envelope to be. Pretty much, pretty much the limit, and that would be handled as part of our house permitting. Okay. Jeff, well, yes. and I'll add to that. I mean, yes, there will have to be per condition in the DEC wetland permit, okay. and actually um, echoed in the conservation commission um, condition I, um, or recommendation that the area behind the house and along the wetland buffer be demarcated. You know, to um, indicate that the owner can't. So you stir it beyond there. Yes. <laughs> All right. And and they paid value for this property as a site that would could be constructed with at least one residence. Yeah, and I I'll just reiterate. I think the prior um, wetland permit was um, sorry wastewater permit was misleading in in that it said no wetlands within 500 feet of either the mount the approved mount system, and these were on approved plans that were re reviewed and approved by the state, or the house, and that wasn't even remotely close to true, so. Um. You, um, you're showing what looks like a water line along Oak Hill. Is that just the, the ditch, or is there actually a water? No, there is a water line. Mm -hmm. Is there a reason you're not tapping into that? Um, the town will not allow it. So we, 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 have, we have water and sewer, um, and in this area um, as it relates to some existing connections. Um, I, I'm trying to think where the water service is. Is that how we... There's a pump station like... Right there. there's, yeah. Well, I know, there's, I know there's, there's wastewater because we serve the Thomas Chittenden Health Center and we <coughs> serve Meadow Ridge, but only <coughs> under... We have a policy that we have a sewer service area that does not actually include those areas. Meadow Ridge was connected to wastewater because its septic system, which is on the other side of Interstate 89 under the dairy farm, failed. Um, and so it was connected under an environmental mitigation provision within the sewer use ordinance. Also, in other words, then the question I asked him, you should have stepped up and said that if his septic field fails, potentially he could end up looking up to our sewer system, right? We would, we would um, not necessarily allow that in this case. We have had one case in Williston of a pre-existing lot not in the sewer service area that was created without proper investigations as to the creation of a septic system. And it, was, it happened to be on Mountain View Road across the street from the sewer service area. And the select board wrote a small carve out uh, and adopted it into the sewer use ordinance to allow, that, to allow essentially that one lot to connect. But generally, uh, one house with a failed septic system that has a spot to replace it, um, even with the sewer line running right there, will, will not be able to connect to town sewer. Um, there is a process they could engage in if they wanted to try, and it, and it involves essentially a petition to the select board to connect under that environmental mitigation remediation um, provision. We, we, we serve Meadow Ridge because Meadow Ridge's septic system failed. We serve Porter Wood similarly because uh, Porter Wood's wastewater system was not adequate over time. Could, um, could they engage in that process due to the fact that the lot would be undevelopable without this variance? So let's say we rejected the variance application. No. There's no environmental problem there today. There's nothing to mitigate. Um, if they were there, if they were there with a system and it failed over time, um, and if if the ordinance stayed the same, maybe. But the hard the hard question that would be asked in that process would be, couldn't you just build another septic system? And and the answer would be, yeah, they probably could. Um, that's you know we we really try to the the town of Williston has tried through its policies to be very very limiting of where it provides sewer because it encourages uh, generally a denser pattern of development um, than is seen as desirable outside of that sewer service area. So, so is it the same logic applies to the water as well? Is that why? Yeah, and I'm, I'm a little bit unclear as to what that water line is serving. I know what happens with wastewater out there. Um, and is I, it the health center? Yeah, I guess it, it would be the health center. Mm -hmm. But this is showing a continuing past. Well, that's the thing is that as I see it, this goes up past the health center. Yeah. So, 
I would have to get back to you, David, on where well, we're going with that. Yeah, but you've, you've made the decision not to tie into it <clears throat> for whatever, for some reason. No, we cannot. They're not allowed to. Okay. But you just don't know why they're not allowed to. Not, I, I know why on sewer. Yeah. I would have to look if there's a parallel for water. Yeah. Um. <coughs> Seems like we'd want more ratepayers if we could. Right? <laughs> if I, I'd like to follow up on that though, but if they were able to <coughs> the, the water line, would that change or improve the ability to locate a septic system? On the site. Okay. Any other questions from the board? No. Any questions from the audience? Anything else like that, Adam? No. One more time for the board. Okay. Thank you for coming. Oh, let's see here. Okay, we're going to uh, close DP 20-16 uh, variants for Jennifer and Pi Tran at 8-12. DP 17-01.2 BlackRock Construction and Benjamin Avery. Mr. Chairman, Chairman, I'm going to repeat myself as a resident of Southridge. Great. Thank you. Uh, let's see. So I do want to make uh, two comments before we uh, let the staff dig into this. And staff, feel free to correct me if I get this wrong. Um, tonight is a night of, of a number of different items showing up on the uh, on the agenda that is, are unusual and or things I haven't seen before. Uh, this is one of them. Um, this is another one of them. Um, uh, just so for the record, this is a fully permitted project. Okay, this is phase two of a fully permitted project. So that we're not here to discuss the project. Uh, we are here to discuss the growth management for phase two. Um, um, so I guess that is that's the statement I wanted to make. So if Matt, if you want to follow up on that, please feel free. Sure. If not. Um, so this is a request for pre-application review. It's for an already approved 39-unit <coughs> residential development off Metcalf Drive in the residential zoning <coughs> district known as Northridge, and this project has discretionary permit and final plan approval from the town. Um, so that means it has a approval for its design, its infrastructure, uh, its its platted lots. It's it's had a plat filed. Um, and it's in a place where the first phase can have permits issued for new dwelling units on it. Um, the sole purpose of this application is to meet the requirement that the project have pre-application review during this calendar year so it can move forward to growth management review in the next calendar year. And the purpose of that growth management review would be for this project to apply for uh, the remainder of the dwelling unit equivalents it needs authorized from the town to build out the project. So there are no changes to the design of the project, the type of units, uh, or any other aspect of the project. There are no changes proposed to the approved final plans. However, um, not all of the residential allocation for this project was granted the first time around because there was a limited supply in that case. The way to get the remainder of your allocation as an applicant is to go through growth management again. And the way our bylaw says you get to go to growth management is if you file a pre-app in the previous calendar year, which is what the applicant has done. So just correct me if I'm wrong, this is a effectively a bureaucratic exercise. Yes. <laughs> we don't often like to admit that. Um, well, but um, I know it's called a spade you, a spade. You admitted it reluctantly. Yeah. Um, but what, you know, what realistically what pre-application review does give the board the opportunity to do and, and the staff and the applicant the opportunity to do is to understand uh, if there have been, as there were this year, any changes to the growth management scoring criteria, uh, open up the ability to have that conversation between now and the hearing in March. 
Um, and the, the bylaw simply doesn't offer any other way to go to growth management in March than to have had a pre-application reviewed in the prior calendar year. Um, so uh, as I said, it was first reviewed as a pre-application in 2016. It received residential growth management allocation for 21 dwelling unit equivalents at the March 28, 2017 growth management hearing. And the project received discretionary <coughs> permit approval on March 13th of 2018 and approved final plans on June 12th of 2018. And again, the applicant is requesting pre-application review to allow them to move forward with a residential growth management allocation request in March of 2020 for the remaining 18 units in the project. And the one thing I'll call out is if it's a 39 unit project on a lot with no existing home, it may only need 17 units because we would understand there to be one unit by right on that undeveloped lot. We will clarify that uh, as part of the processing of the growth management application. Uh, we, did, we did circulate this for review with police, fire, and public works. We did not receive comments from police. Uh, we had some comments from public works and fire. Uh, the, the one that was interesting was the fire department noted that the road proposed as Asher Lane, which has been approved uh, with that name on the plat anyway, sounds an awful lot like Astor Lane, which is an existing road in town and advised perhaps a different name uh, so that they would sound phonetically different should someone call for emergency service. Uh, I have two recommendations there for your consideration <coughs> and a motion prepared authorizing the applicants to move forward to growth management review in March of 2020. Thank you. Housekeeping? And um, if you would state your name and your address for the record, please. Benjamin Avery with Black Rock Construction, South Burlington, Vermont. Thank you. Um, only update on that is, is there was actually um, some back and forth right before we recorded the plat, and the names have been amended to be Cadence, Zoe, and Chloe, respectively. <laughs> so, um, your kids? Uh, no, only one of them is my child. <laughs> uh, but uh, um, so the working documents we submitted for the board's review were not updated with those names, but the, the plat that has been recorded are with the, the names under the guidance of Public Works. That's it. Okay, Questions from the board? Just a thank you on that. <laughs> no problem. Something like two in the morning, you, you, your brain just doesn't function when you hear the names. <laughs> I have no question. No questions. Questions from the audience? Anything else you want to add? <coughs> One more time for the board. Sold. Okay. You Thank coming. you very much. Uh, we're going to close DP 17-1.2 Northridge Subdivision Phase 2 at 819. Your agenda? No, I have my agenda. I lost my, my paper clip. My paper clip. Oh. All right. Here. Thank you. One of Dave's. I'll sell you one. <laughs> Two dollars, yes, sir. <clears throat> okay. Okay, next up on the agenda is DP 13 4.2, Vermont Agency of Transportation. And Scott, I'm going to recuse myself. You're going to recuse yourself as well. Okay. And the reason for the recusal? Uh, my firm is involved in the project. Very good. Simple right here. So we're going to open up. We are going to open up DP 13-04.2 uh, at 8:20. Um, I have a comment on this on this one too. Number <laughs> number three, um, and this is almost unheard of that uh, that we have three of these in a row that are that are different um, for the uh, for the audience. 
and for the board, but mainly, but mainly for the audience. Um, this is a uh, fully permitted project um, with permits in existence on a uh, on a one year extension from the original permits when they were issued. So we are not we are not assuming that nothing has changed from the permitted project. We're not here to talk about the park and ride. We're here to talk about the access. That brings up another problem, is that this board does not have any jurisdiction over the access. The access is controlled by, it because the access is on a state route, uh, DOT or AOT controls the access permit. Um, I get that, did I get that right? Yeah. Um, I'll, I fill, in around the, more, fill in around the edges, I'll please. A little more detail in our Thank discussion. You. But, um, so this is an application for a discretionary permit to amend a previously approved proposal to build a park and ride facility with access, outdoor lighting, and stormwater treatment and other appurtenances at 3294 St. George Road in the Gateway Zoning District South. Um, the scope of this amendment is to extend the access drive onto the parcel to the south of the subject property um, to further separate it from the exit 12 interchange. No changes to the layout, design, or other elements of the park and ride lot are proposed. Um, so at the time of the original approval of this, uh, the parcel where the access is now proposed was owned by a private party, was not under the control of the state of Vermont. That has changed, and as the board may recall from a prior meeting, uh, that parcel is now proposed for the development of a state police barracks that will share its access to Route 2A with the park and ride facility. And I should just note that's being reviewed under a separate action by the board as well, um, not, not part of tonight's review. So this project went through pre-application review in front of the DRB on March 26th of 2013. It received discretionary permit approval on August 12th, 2014. Uh, that proposal was amended on March 22nd, 2016 under an approval by the DRB and final plans were approved on October 13th of 2016. An administrative permit to construct the facility uh, under that design was signed by the zoning administrator on October 10th of 2017. Uh, Williston's bylaw provides that those permits last two years and may be extended on request for a third year. An extension was requested and the zoning administrator, which is me, uh, granted a one-year extension to the administrative permit and that will expire on October 10th, 2020. So that, that active permit that's good until October of next year is for the old design with the old access that's entirely contained on the same parcel as the park and ride. And what's before the board tonight is a proposal to go back and amend that discretionary permit approval to move the access further up the hill, further south on Route 2A, utilizing the adjacent parcel that is now also um, under the control of the state of Vermont. So this is a change to the design of the, uh, well, let me back up. So the first thing is scope of review. So there's a principle in our bylaw that says the scope of the DRB's review when an amendment is proposed will be limited to the scope of the changes. So things like the lighting in the park and ride, the arrangement of the parking spaces, the landscaping, the stormwater, the fact that there's a park and ride proposed here, all of those things are, are not by our bylaw allowed to be modified by any approval of the DRB at this time. You only, you only get to regulate what's new and what's different um, from the old proposal. Um, so 6.10.3.1 in our bylaw, limited scope, the scope of the hearing and DRB action will be limited to determining whether the proposed amendment complies or fails to comply with the bylaw. So what's changing and how is it addressed in our bylaw what's changing is the design of the access to the site uh, we have a chapter on access it's chapter 13 of the bylaw um, and the bylaw notes that when we're dealing with access to a state highway as scott alluded to you consult with vtrans uh, which is also the applicant agency in this case that wants to build the park and ride and change the access to it so who must provide turning lanes, medians, and other access management improvements? Applicants must provide acceleration, deceleration, and turning lanes, medians, and all other improvements, including signs, signals, and lighting, 
that are required to provide safe access to their development. The need for these improvements may be established by the town plan, corridor plans, or traffic studies prepared by the town, the regional planning agency, or the Vermont Agency of Transportation, or by a traffic study required by Chapter 13, Section 13.8. Um, so essentially, what this really directs the, the town to do is go consult with the agency that manages the road. If it's a town road, we talk to the public works director. If it's a state road, uh, we have a process related to the access permit and we go talk to them. So in this case, it's a little bit of a closed system in that the applicant is proposing to add an access in a new location to a road that is under their control um, under the standards that they administer. So. Our by I guess what I'm really saying is <laughs> our bylaw says there should be safe, adequate, reasonable access to new development and that when you're looking to figure out whether those <coughs> things are true, you can have engineering studies, you can consult with the agencies that manage the roads and follow essentially their lead. And here we are. Um, so that's, that's a little bit of the context um, for this review. We do still take this through our full public hearing process because that's how you amend a discretionary permit in Williston and you do need a discretionary permit from Williston um, to build this facility. Um, so we, we noticed this hearing. Uh, we did solicit and receive some public comment. We received letters from Larry Reed, Nicholas Martin, and Sarah Ward. Those were attached to your staff report. Some of those folks are in the audience tonight uh, probably looking to speak to you on this project. Um, this amendment was not reviewed by the Conservation Commission or Historic and Ar Architectural Advisory Committee. Um, prior prior uh, plans with the park and ride were reviewed by Conservation Commission and those conditions continue to stand from that prior approval. We did circulate plans to police, fire, and public works. We received no comments from police and fire department comments, only reserving the right to make further comment at a later stage of the review. Um, there, there isn't one. Their, their department plan review uh, would be something we'd coordinate with them on at, at a minimum through review of final plans, so they would have a chance to comment there. Um, we did also receive comments from Public Works, and I, I wanted to note one specific comment which was related to the standard to which they, they wish to hold the dimensions of that access road involving um, you know, a particular standard within the Public Works specifications. Um, They've commented on some other things about the utilities. We did receive today a response to all of the Public Works comments um, from the agency, which we've handed out to you tonight, and which you're welcome to discuss with the applicant or uh, seek any clarification from us that you need on that ongoing dialogue. Um, and that's where I'll stop for now. Okay. Gentlemen, names and addresses for the record, please. Israel Maynard with Stantec Consulting in South Burlington. And Scott Burbank with VTrans, but ultimately a design consultant with uh, VHB in South Burlington, Vermont as well. All right. Would you walk us through the uh, changes to the access that you are proposing and any other, any other changes that might be in there as well? Yes. The existing permitted access was... So there's a bunch of people who probably would love to see this. Maybe we could reorient, may, reorient the board over there. Scott, or is that... Okay, no, that'll work. You want it at this side so you can see it on the camera. Maybe can you, can you can you go back a little further and then kind of tip it this way? <laughs> Larry, can you see that? Yep. So the existing act permitted access is right here. It's moving approximately 800 feet up to the property line of the new state of Vermont parcel that was acquired. Um, I'd like to clarify one thing too, you know, Matt had discussed, you know, this is the state regulating itself, but, and, you know, we still have to go through the same permit process through the state that any project does. So, although this is a state project, we do need a section 1111 state highway access permit. One of the conditions of that access permit was that when this parcel gets developed, this access was going to have to move. So, so that's why this is being done. When the state bought this and started to plan on development here, that was a condition of that access permit. So that's, that's that discussion. So the, exi the, the additional impervious area created is going to be treated in the um, expanded bioretention area. It's an existing bioretention area, or sorry, existing permitted bioretention area that we're just making larger 
and that amendment, the stormwater amendment, has been completed. It was approved by the state at this time. That's pretty much it. Any other questions? Will any of that, will any of that impervious surface water um, being treated on your site uh, also be coming from the state police site? Or is that, is that totally separate? No. They have separate? That's totally separate. We have curbs and then drop inlets, so we catch all our roads, all the frontage road, and it goes into that bioretention, which then ultimately goes to the dry pond, which then goes into the Muddy Brook watershed. So, as Israel said, that was always there because we were treating the access road before. It's just now the access road is obviously longer, so it had to get bigger. But we do have, we, we have our permit for that. So vehicles will go <clears throat> in and out the new access, or will they go in? Yes, that's correct. So, sure. So in. if you're coming from Taft's Corners, you go under the interstate bridges. Yes. And currently right now, when we build this, there's a slip lane across from here. So you turn, and then you would go this way. I'm assuming the state police would do as well. I don't know. Um, so in theory, yes, you could do this, but most people will do this. Okay. So easier. there's an access. There's a right turn slip lane. Yeah. Right turn. Okay. Yeah. Um, so slip, is slip lane is turning lane. A turning lane. Right. Sorry, thank you. Thank you. Um, and then if you're coming down the hill or from St. George, you will go into the left turn lane and then turn left into the facility and then go down. But if for everyone leaving, they all have to come up and then they need to turn left or right. Out so of if you are if you are coming, if you are driving north, coming down the hill, you turn into your first access, not the second That's one? That's correct. So it, okay. Yeah. Is it possible to turn left coming down the hill? No. But because of that slip lane, right, it's oriented. Right, it's oriented such that it's a curve, so you literally yeah. can't get there. I mean, yes, in the Civic I drive, I'll try it, but. Yeah. <laughs> What's the size of that culvert that's going to be under that? Uh, oh, the one we're replacing? This? Is yeah, a, what's is the size a, of that? It's going to be a 49 inch by wide by 33 inch high um, arch pipe. Yeah, the reason I ask that is because I'll tell you, I have seen water coming down. Two A excitingly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We've done a drainage study in the in this pipe. Actually, the pipe that crosses two A is also being replaced as part of this project, okay. being upsized as well. Yeah, and that was based when we originally permitted this. We talked to um, Mr. Martin, David Martin, not the other Martin, and he noted that right now that his driveway has been waked out. So what we're doing is we're putting a new head wall on that, so it actually comes around like this to catch the water and forces it through that pipe. Because um, I believe right now the pipe is open, but there is a uh, riprap that actually got pushed in there by the force of the water. So, yeah, so in basically what we're doing to, to improve the, uh, or to prevent his driveway from being washed out again, we're going to put in a bigger pipe. So it's wider, you know, it's better to be wider than taller. Are there any modifications to the road? Is there, uh, is it widening anywhere along? Uh, St. George Road in order to accommodate the additional traffic turning in? Yeah, so left turn lane was added on St. George Road. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's and, being and Under the previous permit, you know, this left turn lane was you know, down here. When we move the access, the whole thing slides up with it. Okay, so the widening of the road, I was not on the board at the time when it was originally approved, so the widening of the road was further North. 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 So this yeah, hard to see. down the hill. It used yeah. to do this. And so the turn lane, <coughs> imagine this turn lane starting here. And so we have rights from all these property owners ending at David Martin um, to put in a right turn lane, or excuse me, a left turn lane, um, which we're not doing, but because we have we paid them money and everything, we're cutting their trees and replacing their drive culverts. And you're not now widening down Not widening at all down there. Not, don't don't need those down. rights, but won't. Probably, I mean, I don't even know how we give them up, so. Moved up the hill. Okay. Okay, and what about, um, what's a stop sign is going to be there? Not, there's not going to be a, a blinking light or a signal or anything like that? There'll be a stop sign coming off you know, at this exit road to get on to a There'll be no stop signs on to a And it's going to be a right turn lane going on to? And a left turn. And a left turn lane. Okay, and just a stop sign. Just a stop sign? You want to stop For people leaving the access road. No, so this, so this is, no is guys. So this is this is a good time as a number of people here who are interested in asking questions in the audience and. Um, 
I think that's great, and we should we we should want to do that. If you'd like to do that, just please for your record, um, if you would state your name, uh, your name and your address. And I do think that at this point, you um, feel free to feel free to uh, ask the applicant, the state, um, any questions that you have. Larry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, name and address. Larry Reed, 3325 St. George Road, right here. And I'm right in my corner of my property is right here at the outlet here. Um, I've been there 50 years. And um, I have invested 50 years into my property. And brought its value up to a nice point. Um, so there's a few things. I don't have a problem with the park and ride. If the outlet was down at the bottom of the hill, because I wouldn't bother anybody up here. But by putting it here, and in combination with the state police fair, having maybe 200 plus cars every day coming out from this one spot and not down there, it's going to create a real problem here that I don't care how many, how many engineers have looked at it, it's going to be a problem that's not there now. Um, there's going to be a lot of light pollution from headlights. Imagine uh, we're nine months out of the year here, we're in the dark in the afternoon, and, and uh, so morning and night we're going to have 200 plus cars shining headlights across my property, Martin's property, and Doug Williams' property, and the traffic already is backed up from the bottom of the hill to Walker Hill Road at the end of the day during commuter time. And in the morning, it backs up beyond my driveway. Um, so I feel that this is a, a very big intrusion into a residential name, a zone neighborhood. And uh, many of us are retired and lived here for 30, 40, 50 years, invested all our lives in our property. It's going to take away our um, our privacy and, uh, and it has nothing but negative impacts on us. It doesn't have any benefit for us at all. And uh, when you talk about property value, nobody wants to talk about property value. Everybody just looks at you and stares at you. How do you mitigate property value? Anybody know how you mitigate property value? Yeah, talk to the listers. Because that's that that's the people you have to go and say that my property value has gone down. They're the ones you're going to have to right. talk to to get it dropped. At the airport, with the F-35 noise abatement program, which is still in effect, there are many houses that are still standing, um, and the FAA and the airport um, are buying people insulated windows and doors. But if they have to sell their property because they just can't handle it and they can't get a fair market market value, the FAA is giving them a check for the difference. That's mitigation. Um, so, I don't visualize 140 cars being taken off the road, but rather 200 plus cars being added to the traffic gridlock that uh, occurs every morning and afternoon in the neighborhood. And the development in the area, as everybody knows, is, is so crazy that you can't get anywhere from there anymore. Um, so, I say, why, why not just uh, step back and Take a deep breath and think uh, if this really uh, is a good idea, or you know, or what's what's the good of having everybody in the neighborhood pissed off? Um, we were here first, and uh, I had we all four of us had interviews with Scott and Tina and you That's right. That's right. Uh, in in May. Um, up to discuss what was going on, what was going to happen with our property. We walked around my property and it's about, here, here we're going to have lights, lights and lights and lights, and this is this and this is that. Um, and then when you talk about water, uh, this gentleman, Mr. Christensen, talking about water coming down the hill. Uh, Halloween Eve, uh, my driveway washed out for the 50th time. So um, I caught D-Trans down on Hurricane Lane. And I said, we got some wash out. Yeah, they said, we're going we're to do the whole road up to Oak Creamery Road. We're going to fix the shoulder where it washed out. I said, my apron is washed out a little bit too. 
Well, that's your responsibility. And he said, well, I'll see what I can do. So up they came, and they actually dumped a little crushed gravel, or uh, pavement, I should say, out there at the end. And I thought, well, yeah, that's good. They did that. Um, later that afternoon, I was trying to roll and pack down that stuff, and my lawn tractor went through the ground. There's a sinkhole next to my culvert. So I went back down and got in the, the supervisor of the crew, and I said, I got a sinkhole there. Well, that's your responsibility. So he came up, and he took a look at it, and he said, yeah, that's your responsibility. But I said, I thought you guys were fixing everything on the side of the road here. He says, I put dirt down for you. I said, thank you for my dirt. Um, so, in your plan, as we talked about with the culvert in front of my house, you want to move the culvert back three or four feet. So what happens to that utility pole that's about 12 inches in diameter that's going to be at the end of the culvert? So they'll relocate utilities as necessary if they're in the way of the infrastructure that we plan on, on putting in. Right. So the now you have a line of utility poles, and you're going to have these up here, and then you're going to come in here, and then back out here. Well, I, I don't believe that the, I'll have to look at it closer again, but I don't believe that that utility pole is in conflict with the proposed culvert. Yeah, it is. And one of the reasons that we're, we're pushing that back three feet is, as you've described, I mean, it washes out right. because the ditches don't have the capacity. So the reason you're having impacts, or that you'll have impacts as part of this project is, is to increase those ditch sizes and the culvert sizes in order to, in order to, to allow that flow to. That's interesting because that's a 30 inch culvert there right now. Okay. Your plans call for an 18 inch culvert. All right, well, I'll, I'll look at that again. I, <laughs> that's not gonna work. Yeah, we can increase the size, buddy. Right, the but thing with your 30 inch culvert though is it's it's 90% filled with sediment, so the capacity right. is that of a you know, six inch. That's culvert. because when it was dropped in, it was dropped in in a hurry, and the, this, the uh, north end of the culvert is sitting below the ground level. Yeah. So that's, that's just another problem. But what I'm getting to here is that when you folks came around, uh, you said that uh, that negotiators now were going to be the next step. The negotiator, you had a really great negotiator, was going to come around and try to, uh, you know, make us feel good and do some stuff for us. That's never happened. I can answer that. It's Tim Bowen. Name, name and address, please. Um, 2016 West Hill Road, Northfield. Name. Tina Bowen. Um, I spoke with a negotiator um, today and he is um, currently coming up with uh, values for all the easements and rights that we need for you. And he intends to um, send out um, and talk to you guys in the next couple of weeks. Okay, hey, well that's, that's interesting because like I said, nobody has ever reached out to me at all or any of the rest of us. And, and in order to do some of the stuff you want to do, you've actually obviously got to get an easement for Doug Williams to take the front of his lawn off here. And also Mr. Yashi, who is here, uh, to take part of his property uh, as well. You, you need some, some uh, easements there. Mm -hmm. And, um, and um, you're, you're not actually taking my property, but you're taking, um, because of the headlights and such, and this culvert deal um, uh, creating a, a big problem for me. So I've got some problems that need to be dealt with. Um, and so that's, that's how I feel about it all. And uh, too late now, but the Ramsey property should never have been uh, rezoned to uh, the GZDS. It, I think it was agriculture before because nobody ever took into consideration these residences here when they rezone that. I think that's about it. Unless some, I hope you all read my emotional letters. I tend to ramble and repeat myself, but if you can imagine, 50 years, um, I uh, am very passionate about my property and I love my privacy. And this is right in my face. So the negotiators, I understand it, the negotiators have not visited any of the... No, not yet. He, he's um, working on, obviously he has more than this project, but he, he told me he's working <coughs> with the figures for each. And working with in, in Mr. Reed's case, does, um, is there any, any mitigation or any, any allowance made for the, the fact that uh, traffic lights will be, the traffic lights, um, headlights will be pointing right at his house coming out? 
I, I really add too, it's not just me, but the Martins as well. Yeah. Okay. And, and Mr. Williams as well. So what, what uh, assume that the assume that that access is is there and positioned there. What you know, no, nobody's going to want nobody's going to want headlights pointed at their house 24 hours a day. Or. I mean, there could be landscaping or fencing or something along those lines to keep lights out. Okay, is but that handled? It, how is that handled by the state? Is that part of the negotiating that's process? That's part of the negotiating process. Yeah. yeah. So, for instance, the berm, um, that was something that Mr. Uh, Williams brought up to us when we were talking with him. So that's why that's shown on the plan is, is yes. that berm. So that berm, that is a berm, that is Mr. Williams' berm facing, that's facing south, correct? Right, his property. Yep. Mr. Williams. So Mr. Williams, are you here? Hill. You're here. Okay. All right. So you could absolutely, I mean, when he's with the negotiator, that's your time to, to ask for things. But doesn't it need to be part of the... Like, let's say there is something negotiated with one of the um, property owners. Doesn't it need to be part of the amendment? How does it get incorporated into the conditions of approval? So if you see something or hear about something that you believe is necessary for this project to be compliant with our bylaw, like a, a screening berm provided off-site um, or across the road, then you would want to make that a condition of approval. Um, so I'd have to do a little digging in the bylaw to find you a citation um, related to, this isn't quite like a landscape buffer where I can just say, oh, it's a type two buffer of this many feet wide when this is happening. This is more going to be in our chapters related to nuisance and offsite impacts and how to mitigate them. And so you, you could as a board you know, especially if you see some agreement or, or, or some ideas come out tonight, you could say applicant, you know, final plans shall show what the applicant has selected for mitigation related to these offsite impacts. But you, you'll need to find some, something in the zoning bylaw that you, you believe that's necessary uh, for the project to comply. Larry? I'm relating to that, Scott, okay. here. In your conditions of approval, Number five says the applicant shall enter into a development agreement with the town guaranteeing any required public or private improvements. Now, oh, we can yep. read that probably any way you want. Um, it sounds to me like that anything that might be negotiated, whether it, and, and it also talks about um, easement agreements, offers, uh, warranty deeds, anything, all of that is all required to be in the final plans at the town level that's for the town yeah conditions here yeah Un yeah understood can i back up for just a quick second and ask why the change so even okay i understand that this, there's a proposal for the uh, police barracks and the newly acquired lot next door but what why what, what difference does that make to safety and queuing so um, when traffic queues, it queues up from here, right? You're trying to get on the interstate. And so imagine if you were trying to get out here and the traffic queues up. The traffic queuing length, which I guess we did do a traffic study. So as you recall, part of the BGS proposal was that um, there's discussion about the traffic study. Staff mentioned that they had done one previously. We recognized that it didn't include VSP. So we have performed that study and it, you know, to see if there's a need for a signal here and it doesn't warrant a signal. Um, but when we did that, we also looked at queue lengths. Uh, PM peak is my understanding is the worst, but the idea is yes, it does queue up here, but then it clears rather quickly. So it's easier to get out of, onto Route 2 here than it is to here. It's also easier because you have better line of sight up and down the hill because it's on what we call a crest. A crest. This is on a steep tangent. Um, and also, I mean, the slopes here, it's very steep here. It's not as steep here. And Joe, so the other thing is that if, if that were to go in there and then the other site were developed, you would now have two access points along that same well, stretch of road. Well, you could still have this, the police barracks utilize, you could do the reverse, right? The police barracks could utilize a To go down to the other site, I suppose. But then, it would, but, then it would, right. but then it would get right. into the because queuing, our DRP the queuing permit problem. actually says we have to build this when this is developed. Exactly. Yeah. And so, so th that's, that was a question I had, which was, hang on. If for whatever reason the state police barracks hits a snag, they find a rare plant, who knows what, 
Is this going to get built regardless, or are you going to wait and come back to the original? No, building? it's going to get built. I mean, you will it, you will not, develop this now. Yes, the intent is that in theory our schedule is ahead of the state police, but as you noted, we have right away negotiations, which they take what they take, um, so they could be ahead of us. But yes, the intent is that we're going to um, uh, to construct that ahead of them, and then they would come in and construct their facility afterwards. But it, I mean, regardless of whether it's the state police or somebody else, the point is that. From the agency's point of view, no acts. This is a bad location, and this was not a great location. This is the best or preferred. I don't know. Best is not the right term, but the preferred location. And that is that is really as far south because of the private dwelling. Right, sitting yeah. right there. That's, that's as, as far, far as we south can go. as it can go. We get ourselves anyway, as far correct. away from exit 12 interchange right. as possible, which takes us out of that queuing. It takes us out of the the traffic. Larry, did you want to show the board something? Um, uh, this is the Martins. This is real time traffic backed up the hill. At to about four this point at four or five o'clock. Yeah. Every, right day, Every day, day. Yeah. we cannot get out of our driveway without sitting there for five minutes. So right. you add 200 plus cars to that. Well, you're not adding 200 cars, I guess. So. Well, 140 in the park and ride and maybe 70 employees at the state police and whatever you're going to have up there. So they don't all leave at the same time. It's your turn so, so I'm not a traffic everybody, expert. So everybody, we address the board with our comments, okay? So let's not have a, let's not let this descend into a rancorous debate, okay? If you have a comment, so I guess if you have a comment, please address the board. So to answer the questions on traffic, we, I mean, Rick Bryan is here from Stantec, and he did do the traffic study, so I guess he can speak to all of that better, definitely better than I can. I am not a traffic engineer. Uh, Rick Bryan is Stantec Consulting. And, and you know the question in terms of added traffic. Um, this we're in the process of finalizing a, a third traffic study. Um, we did a traffic study many years back when the Ramsey parcel was being subdivided, and we um, considered uh, 200 hotel rooms in that property, the park and ride lot, and a gas station convenience store and we projected traffic up and down to a associate with that development. Brought it before you, brought it before So, Rick, state. hold that hold that thought for one second, just so the board knows. There is a privately owned parcel between the state police and the uh, park and ride that at some point in time could be developed, okay? It isn't it, even in this traffic count. It is not in this traffic count. No. Or it is not in, it is not in this proposal. It may be in your traffic there count. It's today, there but it go. is in the study that you all got to you who were there at the time got a chance to look right. at years ago, as did, as did V Trans. Um, I just wanted everybody on the board to understand that that's, that that is there. Go ahead, Rick. And, and that was sort of at a broad master planning level. <clears throat> um, a few years later, V Trans came in with a specific plan for the park and ride that needed to go through a, a site plan approval process, basically, you know, where the catch basins, where the trees, how the parking stalls laid out. So there was very detailed review. And at that time, we did a new study that just looked at traffic associated with the park and ride, anticipating that that would be built before the stuff behind the hotel and all that would come much later. So there's a separate study that you have and had been reviewed and permitted um, for just the park and ride facility. And the third effort that's underway is to say, okay, we, we now know that something's happening uh, at the BGS site. Uh, in our prior study, we referred to that as a Solomon parcel. I don't know if that name still uh, is being used, but um, so just south of the Ramsey parcel, as we started out, we have the Solomon parcel. We now have a building program for that. Uh, we helped BGS at the time uh, figure out what could fit on the site and how much traffic it would generate. Um, that was really an internal document, but we brought those figures forward as well from a traffic perspective to say, okay, layer. The, the park and ride traffic onto the roadway, layer the Ramsey development, the hotel and the gas station, and now add this third layer of the um, BGS development. And so our forecast, I, I'll give you the number so you get a sense of the impact, and basically where we are now is very nominal effect of, of what has not yet been permitted uh, from a traffic perspective. All the things can that you, are can you us, Can you say that again in layman's yeah, terms? Sure. <laughs> You, you've looked at and said yes to um, the park and ride proposal, which per the prior studies will add about 100 trips to the roadway system at peak times. When you, that park and ride are open, you sat out there from <coughs> 7.30, 8.30 in the morning, 
you'd count roughly 100 vehicles coming in or out. If the hotel, the gas station all gets built, you would see roughly 200 more vehicles in that one hour. So what's already been proved is about 300 vehicles per hour, 300 to 350. It varies different from the a.m. to the afternoon rush hour. But those, that's the order of magnitude. Um, what is the hour? What hour? Is it? Yeah, seven, seven to five, the, five to six? The last count show the peak from 7.30 to 8.30 a.m., 4.30 to 5.30 p.m. The program for the state police barracks and there's a salt shed for V-Trans as a uh, safety building, <coughs> um, that's about 40 trips in the peak hour. So you've got 300 that's been said yes to and BGS adds about 40 to that. So it's a 10% it's a change. When you look at those 40 trips spilling out onto the road, going down through the interchange, which has some operational issues that we see and causes the queuing, um, it, it adds less than 1% down at the interchange. So it's a fairly nominal impact on what's already been approved. Uh, and, and to, you know, I'm throwing out numbers. Um, just to put that in context, the Hurricane Lane, um, you see that every day. You see cars coming and going, getting in and out without a signal. And on Hurricane Lane in the morning rush hour, uh, 350 vehicles per hour. So it's even more than what we're envisioning um, you know, just from the Ramsey parcel. And that number is about 280 in the afternoon peak hour. So again, just these numbers have some context. That's what's going on today that you can see at Hurricane Lane. Um, so again, those are the, the impacts that we look at. You're at about 300 to, to 350. That would happen with everything built out. And another 40 <coughs> that's happening with the BGS piece. Um, really not changing things down at the interchange. There's some longer term plans that and again, I guess there's been a scoping study done a couple of years back um, that this board looked at, talked about some of the things that can happen in the, at the interchange short term and long term to help make things work a little better there. Um, Scott mentioned, you know, one of the questions from the start has been, does there need to be a light at this driveway? Uh, when we looked at everything else, no, we weren't at that level of volume yet. Uh, we added BGS, we're, we're still not there. Uh, bring us a little closer. It probably makes sense when we construct the driveway, we'll put some conduit under the road so that if you were to come back 10 years later uh, because you decided you did want a signal or, the, or say George Road get busy enough that it now justified a signal, you wouldn't have to tear up the pavement to, to put that in. But um, not a need for it based on what we see being built out on this site. May I ask what the threshold is for a signaled intersection? So um, it's it's fairly complicated. You, you have to look at the volume of traffic that's on, on the main street, the volume of traffic that's coming out of the side street, and, and based on our forecast of what's coming out of that driveway, uh, we're about three, four hundred vehicles short out on St. George Road. Uh, and that's after we've assumed... Um, three or four hundred at peak? At peak hour, right. Yeah, yeah there's, there's 1,100 um, 1, vehicles out there now uh, in the afternoon. If you, if you were to stand at that driveway and count what's going by, um, which we do, <laughs> that's what we do for a living. I tell, I tell people I'm a traffic engineer, they say, what, is, what does that mean? So I was like, count cars. Um, we were out there counting cars. Um, there's about 1,000 vehicles go past that driveway, 7.30, 8.30 a.m. That number is about 1,100 and 4.30 or 5.30 p.m. If that number to get to 1,400, which is substantial growth, um, we may want to think about putting in a traffic light, but uh, we're not there. And so there's currently 1,000? 1, 1,100. 1,000 in the morning, 1,100 in the afternoon. Okay, so 1,000 a.m., 1,100 p.m. And, and you're saying we're going to add about three to 400? No, no. I, well, for the, for the, the development, the yes. The proposed development yes, yes. will add three to 400 to that number. But it's on the driveway, so that's coming in and out of the site. I'm talking about what's going past the site. Okay. Okay. And you, again, you're getting into the technicalities of the warrant. I got to look at what's what's in front of me that's keeping me from making a left turn out of the driveway. And that that number, the cars that's going when I'm waiting to make a left turn out, I'm waiting on 1,100 cars right now. 
if that number were to go to 1,400, then I would be thinking about a signal. Well, if South Burlington punches Van Sicklin over the Dorset, your number's going to be reached. Just to let you know. Could, could happen, which is, again, why we're saying put, put conduit in, you're prepared for the future. Um, what we factored into this is, like I said, we put the we loaded the park and ride into the system. We loaded the hotel, the gas station, the BGS program, and we're still 300 cars short. Oh, and on top of that, <laughs> uh, VTrans tracks volumes on all its roads statewide, and they tell us and they look at economic development, uh, households, jobs to be created. So they envision that over the next five years, traffic's going to grow another three percent. Um, so even that's into our analysis, and again, we're still coming up short. And when you say you have conduit under, you have conduit under there. Is that part of the proposal that is to be permitted? Is we, we would recommend that that go in now. Wait, yeah, when this all gets dug up, and, and keep in mind, conduits is you know a little BBC pipe that goes under the road, just so you can thread some wires through it without having to dig up the road. Okay. Is there any other infrastructure that is needed in order to put a signal light there as part of the design of this um, that could be approved? In terms of what the pavement that we're, we have out there, there's, there's plenty of pavement, so we're not widening the road to put in a signal. It's just the signals themselves. You'd have to put a foundation in the ground to hold the pole, and then the mast arms get put on the pole. So uh, again, the only thing that would force you to tear up the road um, would be to get the wires across. And even that can be done with tunneling, tunneling but if we're going to have some widening done, <coughs> that's the best time to put the conduit in. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. My name's Doug Williams. I'm the property the road's going across my lawn. Uh, you said that there's going to be 100 employees going into the police station. And you said that's only 40 trips a day? No, no, no. That's, that's a lot uh, of people calling in sick. Correct. <laughs> Uh, no, we said you said 40 trips. 40 in one hour. So, okay, so if, if everyone showed up to work at the same time and everyone drove and no one was sick, um, we're actually told there's going to be maybe 70 employees. So we're we actually modeled 95 <coughs> employees, so we're being conservative. But the last meeting I went to, so, they were saying 100. Okay, there, I, you've got I was the, being uh, told 70, but I've used 95. So we're in the ballpark. Yeah, if everyone were driving, no one were sick, and they all showed up at the same time, you'd expect 70 cars to come into the site all at once. We, well, as I said, we count cars, so we go to, you know, an office building where we know there's so many employees, and we sit there and we count the cars in and out, and we don't see it one for one. People are spread out over several hours. People are sick. People come in late. People have to drop kids at daycare, so... It's not as simple as saying 70 employees means 70 cars come in an hour. It's, we're saying 40 an hour. That translates to several hundred over the course of the day. We're, when we're studying traffic and operations and, and again, the comments about you know, the queue, well, you go out there now, there's no queue. We don't, we don't focus on 10 o'clock at night. We focus on 7.30, 8.30, 4.30, 5.30. So that's why I'm talking about what's happening in an hour. So. 40 in an hour. It's, it's more than that for the day, for sure. Any So, another concern I have anyway, if this was to all happen, um, we were somewhere I read that all the construction would be taking place at night. Who's going to sleep listening to construction going on all night? Hot summer night, your windows are open, and you got construction going on all night. Lights, machinery. Who's going to sleep? That's not fair to... So the reason we have to do it at night is because of the traffic volumes. Well, I understand that. I know that just like they do interstate stuff. When there's less traffic, that nobody's living on the right. sidelines. The well, I agree. It will be annoying. It shouldn't be... It's also about decibel levels, how loud things are. We can do things to mitigate it. We can uh, have the beeping on the trucks. They have a different sound that helps. Um, we can also, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things we can do to mitigate it, the and, construction. Um, it's only going to be the widening part. Only the work on Route 2A will be done at night. 
the rest of the work. Yeah, the rest of the work will be daytime. Do you have an anticipated duration for that construction period? Just for Route 2A? Mm -hmm. the, the night work. Don't. But, I mean, it's we're box cutting and widening, right? Yeah. So, I mean, it all comes down to production rate, potentially a month, but they'll be moving. I don't know. That seems slow to me. Yeah, it'll probably be done faster. It'll be faster than that. It'll be faster than the uh, two-way effort going to Nesic Junction. Two-way effort. That's two years. <laughs> I don't know. Are you talking about the Crescent? or? No, I'm talking about the section of two-way going into Nesic Junction. Is that by James Brown Drive? Oh, by James Brown Drive. Yeah. yeah. We'll be faster than that. <laughs> I'm assuming so. asking a question. I have no clue. Um, if it's, I don't know because not my project. But um, yeah, I mean, it, we can do things to um, make them move faster. They being the contractor, certainly, and we can prescribe things. Um, we do have guidelines and special provisions for for working at night in urban areas and residential areas. I mean, it is unfortunate, but I don't know. There's not much I can do about it because I either clog up the entire roadway, um, or I work at night. So, I mean, the volume of traffic is such that it's, we have to do some night work. But we can certainly try to mitigate that to the minimum. I mean, the reality is that we're putting in three lanes where there used to be two, so once we have that widening, we could probably do some shifting of traffic and do some daytime work during off-peak. But yeah, we can do our best to mitigate that. If you kept the road wider, kept the three lanes all the way down, would that mitigate some of the impact of the traffic because it would spread it into three lanes? I guess I'm, I'm looking at you. Yeah, we, we, we right now have uh, two lanes of queuing at the light at the southbound ramp. So um, if you were to try to extend that further up the hill, you'd have the same number of cars in a queue they just be spread out over two lanes. Um, I, I'm not sure that's the, the best strategy, give, given the, the in potential impacts to abutters along the roadway and the, the, and the ditch and the drainage and all that we've talked about. I really think widening up the hill is, is inappropriate. I'm not suggesting you don't widen up the hill. Yeah. What I'm saying is, have you considered just keeping it three lanes? all the way through past the highway to mitigate the queuing all the way up into the residential area that they're the, the queuing the queuing issue is a result of what's going on at the interchange so it's a it's a matter of getting <coughs> cars more cars through the interchange more quickly and, and three lanes wouldn't get it quicker uh, well, you, you can only really fit two under E9 right now. Okay. So, so you, you couldn't do a third lane under the bridge. You could perhaps widen to do a third lane to slip onto the ramp to go southbound in 89. Uh, the number of cars making that right turn is such that if you added it, you would shorten the queue by maybe two cars. Rick, is there, it, it's, I'm not sure it's germane or not, but is there something, maybe it's for Scott too, is there a, pro, a project to um, improve that intersection in the, um, it's been in the works something while, with circle right? alternatives. I know we're looking at the sidewalk. Is Kenny Up Mall's, I don't know what Kenny Up Mall's project is doing. It's, 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 it's a scoping of that whole area, but I don't know what it is. I don't know what yeah, it is. Yeah, I don't know. The, the scoping was going to. Go ahead. The, the scoping study talks about the <coughs> shared use path going, going through there, so you get Yep. pedestrians out of the roadway, which is primarily a safety improvement, but it, it does help people who are trying to get up the hurricane lane that work at the hotel and are uh, relying on transit. And it also wants to get two lanes coming southbound uh, toward the interchange. And that, that would, in fact, help get more cars through that light and let the whole system work a little better. So that's the other part of the short-term fix, as well as just you know, keeping tabs on the signal timing, make sure that it's being responsive to the demands that may shift over time. Larry? Just, just to kind of answer my question a little bit, but yeah, I dedicated right-hand lane down at the bottom to get southbound off the interstate with leave. I disagree by two cars, about many, many cars that want to turn up right to go 
South, yeah, there's a lot of cars in there. Not two cars, many. Yeah. We go up and down it all the time. We live there. And uh, just one last thing before I forget or don't have a chance to say it. Is there anybody in this room that would like to have this in their front yard? I want to see a show of hands. Nobody would like it, would you? Are the Martins here? Yes. Did, did, uh, did they talk to you about uh, replacing all those cedars for you or not? No, not about the cedars. My, my concern is when I inherited the trees, that I want the trees gone. Those big trees in front of my property. Because okay. when I put in the cedars, I came to the town and I said, how far from the road can I put my cedars on? You know, and they said 49 feet. It's five rod road. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So I did. And somehow, magically, I gained property. And the trees are on my, they're my de deal now. And uh, well, no, no, what, I'm trying, what I'm asking the question is, you're concerned that the cedar is going to be cut down, right? No. no. Oh, okay. I, no. I misunderstood no. that then. No. Different Martin. Oh. That's what you're talking about. You're talking about Nicholas Martin. There's Martin's on both sides. There's Martin on both sides. <laughs> I have no idea if they're related or not. <laughs> no. But um, so he has cedars. I'm going to give you guys jerseys so I know what you're talking about. Okay, so the Martins that have the, the trees that you come tonight. You do have cedars. You have his letter. I know I have his letter. Right. I was just yeah, about to ask him. He was supposed to be here. We've, I've talked to Nick many times. I was times. just asking, I was going to ask him if the mitigators or whatever they are had talked to him about replacing those. He, he, yes, he did so. talk to him about it, but I'm not sure if it was satisfactory. So when we met with him, we explained to him that the idea is there's a thing called cost of cure. So the idea is we are cutting his cedars, and I can't grow a 10-foot cedar. So we told him that you know if you wanted a fence, that would be an option as well. Although there are DRB requirements for fencing along there, um, but in, you know it's hard to put cedars back. So um, we can, but we can only do like two. I mean, we just can't get what he has back in this time. So we could put in a fence for him, but the intent would be that either we. I mean, ideally. In a perfect world, the state would give the property owner the money. They would hire out a contractor, and they would install it separate from our project. But we can also do it as well. Um, yeah, I mean, there's that's the thing is that until we go, we the engineers can talk about things, but we don't handle the money. We can't promise anything. That's where the negotiations come in. Yes, I know. I'm just falling here, but was there ever a discussion of coming out right onto the? So to the right and Oh, onto the exit itself, yeah. limited access. FHWA right. probably wouldn't let us, right? They absolutely, they absolutely wouldn't let us. It, was there a attempt to do that? No, there, there, all we would, it's a limited access road. It's got federal restrictions about what you can do with it. That's not an allowable. And it's not, it's a federal road. So the state can't do it. Is that what you said? It's a limited access road, so there's only certain things you can do, and that's not one of them. Yeah, like they like they tried to put the exit off the interstate to the mall, and that got shut down, which would have really cut down traffic at uh, the deadly intersection there at uh, to endorse it. On another point, what is this manual air release slash Chlorine injection point. Oh, that was just a response to DPW's question on um, one of the symbols that was in the roadway right here. And what it is is when they construct a water line, they need to be able to bleed the air off at the high point in the line, which will be on Route 2, 2A. And they also need, need to be able to inject chlorine to temporarily flush and dis or, or disinfect the line. That's, that is controlled, right? What's that? That, that? that injection point is controlled? Yes, yeah, they'll shut the valve off, inject chlorine. No, 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 no. I'm talking about is that is controlled that Security. Joe Blow can't walk up and decide to inject something else into the water line. Oh, oh no, yeah, yeah, they're, 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 they're underground yeah, there. They're um, not accessible. <coughs> Can you 
Can you describe the berm that you're proposing um, to protect the adjacent property from the headlights? Yeah. yeah, so just be simple earth berm, roughly three to four feet tall, three on one mobile slopes, and then it'll be planted with uh, six to seven foot tall Norway spruce trees. And um, that three to four feet will be adequate to shield the headlights from the buses that are coming in and out of there and the trucks and the snow plow vehicles that have the headlights that shine right in your rear view mirror when they're behind you. Yeah, and that's what the adi the additional plantings are for. We didn't want to put, you know, a big 15 foot tall earth berm there because it would, go, it would extend well onto his property and it would just look unsightly. And you um, discussed this berm with the, with the BGS? With the landowner? BGS is the landowner. State of Vermont building and ground is where this berm is going. Actually, so we're talking about he, he's talking about the landowner, <laughs> the landowner you. next to the property. Oh, Mr. Williams. Oh, Mr. Yes. Williams. Yeah, I yes. don't know. I don't know them, and so okay. yeah. yeah, who we're shielding from? Yes, yes. That was it. Was his request that we added. understand? I just want to make sure that he understands how mm -hmm. big that berm is and that it's it's adequate for it meets his his desires. Larry, I might make a suggestion. This might be helpful for everybody on the board. If you're not really familiar, really familiar with this, it might be good to have a field trip and come up and take a look and walk and take a real good look. Yeah, come up about board baby. Come up. Yeah. <laughs> take a look and be familiar really with what is proposed here. I live just past there, so I drive it every day, a few times a day. We all live in Williston and have there are a, a number of uh, busy intersections that we all wrestle with frequently. So okay. just, just I guess the other question I would have here has to do with the landscaping along this access road. And there were discussions just two weeks ago yeah. about the property there. And we couldn't really discuss the landscaping because it was along this road. So I want to make sure that we're able to, as we're discussing the the next stage of the state barracks, if we wanted to add additional landscaping that happened to be in this project's uh, area, how would how might we do that? So you're asking who's responsible for the land between the two roads. The two roads. Yes. And I think that I think BGS was BGS. kicking it to you guys. They were, and yet, so now we're going to be wanting to <coughs> perhaps ask for some stuff there that's going to be screening a different project. Yeah, so one thing we've done since the plan set that, that you have in front of you is we have added street trees per DRB requirements. Yep. Um, one of the DRB um, points is that through currently forested areas, we can get a waiver for street trees, so we would like to have a waiver in these areas where the vegetation is dense you know these these areas um we've added trees here where the vegetation is not so dense at the uh 40 foot spacing required by the by the um zoning bylaw you know that that vegetation in there is scrub i mean it's yeah, yeah. we can cut it it just when you look at google earth uh, the Ramsey property line, well, I guess where the future potential uh, salt shed is, that's where it seems to change. But obviously on this map, it doesn't look, I know why they're deciduous. Yeah. But um, yeah, and this is fall. But anyways, we can cut them and add street trees. We can not cut them and add street trees. Doesn't matter to us, we'll do whatever. And then I think to your point though, you're talking about between the drive and the roadway, there's supposed to be a type one or type four, which is like basically a cluster of trees every hundred feet, similar to what we did further down north on the park and ride. And <coughs> we weren't gonna cut anything in there. I mean, we're not touching it except for that utility crossing. So we were just gonna leave it as is. So you're gonna leave the scrub? I've never seen a road that's built that doesn't affect the trees on, substantially on either side of it. Yeah, and, and it'll so be when clear you said you're going to leave it, well, no, you're not going to leave it because the equipment's going to be but doing... It, and it'll be clear 10 feet outside curb lines on each side. But what we're, the typical that's um, in the Williston zoning bylaws has those trees set like you know, 20 or 30 feet outside the curb line. So it's you know, that's in the location where we actually would have a cleared line. So we were hoping just not to, to clear existing vegetation in order to plant street trees. But I mean, like Scott said, if, if the 
the board wants that done, we can it's not Right, but to on. your point, you were saying, I mean, there is enough width there that something's going to be left because we'll put up project demarcation fence and they don't cross it. So, right. I mean, we only have so much of an easement. We can't go over it. Yeah, it's a violation of the of control permit if they go of course. outside. The, the, the interesting thing here is that, you know, we've asked the, 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 the police project to give us an image of what, how that's going to look. <laughs> but then it's the trees that you're either going to cut or not cut. And, and we, until we see that, we're going to have less of a basis to make what you're asking us to tell you right now. So there's a temporal problem here of we haven't gotten that back. So how can we tell you what to do, yet you're looking for us to give you a permit now, at which point then we would have a hard time changing that. Right, but I think we, I mean, we can make the decision, yeah, we're going to cut and put in street trees or we're not. I don't see whatever you want to do. I mean, it's not going to Is that going to improve, be better or worse at screening than what's there now? Uh, up and there, I, there isn't much I can't much tell screening. from what I'm looking at here. Right. There, what's, I mean, what's there now is most, most junk. Well, I, again, I, but they're not showing me that. And so, well, you know, you gotta, so you, you, you do is drive if by it. you're you're offering then to, to to take that out and put in the street trees. Yeah, I mean, if, if the board were to, decide to your point, that, I think if you didn't take them out, you would have more. I mean, the whole point is the cover from I don't remember what exactly it was, but you wanted a view looking up from 89, right? Going south, a rendering. So, I mean, if you go on 89 and you look south, yeah, it would probably be better not to put in the street trees because the street trees clear more swath, right? then if we're not clearing out that much, we aren't going to go that far with our clear cutting for our road. But if we put street trees in, then we do have to clear out more because we have to be 10 feet from the back of curb. So now we got to go another 10 feet that necessarily, right? I mean, yeah, we've got to go 10 feet outside the, the any utility we have along. Right, it's the utilities. Otherwise, we would not go that far. Is that a true statement or not? No, OK. So I think if you're looking for clear, if you're looking for cover, not adding street trees is the way to go. But to Scott's point, they, you know, as they've been in there, sort of, it's all shrubby, nasty stuff in there. So um, it might be beneficial to add the street trees. There's, there's very little redeeming quality of the existing vegetation. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. And so, and yet, right. So the environmental benefit. I'm just, you know, and, and if we wanted to, because we've, this has been, we've, we heard two weeks ago that that's a very special site right there. And that maintaining that view as a wooded area is very important. I'm not saying that we can actually do this because I don't know the answer to that. But if we wanted to actually put more trees in there because it's important to protect that and to maintain the view of that site as a wooded hillside, we would have to do that now. Is what I, that's my understanding. And that's... I feel like we're being asked to make a decision now that we don't know, we don't have all the information. Well, it's something we can talk to discuss. Are suggesting that we would clear additional trees and then plant new trees to make it appear wooded? I don't want to solve it here. I want to make sure that there is a methodology in yeah. place that we could do that as we move forward. Or do we have to, after we deliberate, when we deliberate, are we making the decision tonight on this? You know, or is there some way that we might be able to leave that open? Sounds like whoever's going to build that hotel has got a one hell of a, a landscaping built. This right. has nothing to do with the hotel. Well, no, but it would come back after the fact. So, okay, we can discuss that as a board. Yeah. Sir? Uh, I know this doesn't have to do with the police station, but since you brought it up about the, uh, the view, the wooden, the forest view from the interstate side, can you have them do one from my side? Because there, there's going to be no forest left. They're just clear cutting that whole thing. I'm going to be looking right straight into this project. They don't have any trees in there at all. I'm trying to remember whether we asked that. Is that, a, that is not a that is not a question for this hearing, sir. I apologize. Okay. If you come to the come when they it come like back, an opening, so. I know it looked like an opening, <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I applaud you for taking advantage of that. Well, you guys did a, con a recommendation at the pre app for that one. Yes. About Landscape, but, but we need to discuss that under different, that hearing. Yeah. Different hearing. I've just, yes. just one more thing for, for Tina. Uh, the reparations, um, can we get uh, something a little more? Because I, I was told 
that I would be getting something two weeks ago. And like I've told you, my wife has leukemia and stress is something I'm supposed to keep her away from. So it, it, it's, whatever thing doesn't happen, it's, so if I could get like a date from this guy or a, a uh, week. I can uh, call him tomorrow and see if I can get a date from him. I appreciate that, thank you. Other questions from the board? I'd recommend that you contact her for the date of the next uh, hearing for the, our staff for the oh. date of the hearing that you oh. want to come back and talk about okay. in the police barracks. Has that been scheduled yet? No, no but you'll no. get in a butters letter in the mail. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now, when we were across the road, when they're discussing the police, will we get notice of that meeting? The properties that are across, directly across from 2A, uh, will get notices. Comments from the audience? Any other comments from the board? Any questions from the board? Applicants, anything else you want to cover? I don't think so. I think that's it, right? Anything else you want to cover? I think we covered it. Okay. Thank you for coming. Thank you. It is 10:10, uh, and it is Tuesday, November 12th, 2019. <coughs> uh, the Town of Williston Development Review Board is out of uh, executive session um, and deliberation. Um, you need to close that. Up. Yeah, I, I'll do that when we get to okay. it. Um, first up is uh, DP 20-14 Adams Real Properties. Jill, do uh, would you make a motion, please? Yes. Yeah. Authorized by WDB 6.6.3, I, Jill Spinelli, move that the Williston Development Review Board, having re reviewed the application submitted and all accompanying materials, including the recommendations of the town staff and the advisory boards required to comment on the application by the Williston Development Bylaw, and having heard and duly considered the testimony presented at the public hearing of November 12, 2019, Accept the finding of fact and conclusions of law proposed by the staff for the review of DP 20-14 and approve this discretionary permit subject to the conditions above. This approval authorizes the applicant to file final plans, obtain approval of these plans from staff, and then seek an administrative permit for the proposed development, which must proceed in strict conformance with the plans on which this approval is based. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. All seconds it. Any further discussion? No further discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Seven ayes, no nays. Motion carries. <coughs> Excuse me. Next is DP 20-15, Kevin Mazuzin. Would you like to make a motion? As authorized by WDB 6.6.3, I, Peter Kelly, move that the Williston Development Review Board, having reviewed the application submitted and all accompanying materials, including the recommendations of the town staff and the advisory boards required to comment on this application by the Williston Development Bylaw, and having heard and duly considered the testimony presented at the public hearing of November 12, 2019, accept the recommendations proposed by staff for the review of DP 20-15 and authorize the applicant to proceed to residential growth management <coughs> allocation review. Thank you. Uh, do I have a second? I'll second it. Dave seconds it. Any further discussion? No further discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Seven ayes, no nays. Motion carries. Next is DP 20-16. Uh, it is a variance for Jennifer and Hi Tran. Dave, would you make a motion, please? Yes. As authorized by WDB 6.6.3, I, David Turner, moved the Williston Development Review Board, having reviewed the application submitted in all accompanying materials, including the recommendations of the town staff and the advisory boards required to comment on this application by the Williston Development Bylaw, and having heard and duly considered the testimony presented at the public hearing of November 12, 2019, Accept the findings of fact and conclusions of law proposed by staff for DP 20-16 and grant the requested variance for reduction in the 50-foot watershed protection buffer and 50-foot street setback. Do I have a second? 
Second. John seconds it. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 No abstentions. Any nays? One nay. One nay. Six ayes, no abstentions, one nay. Motion passes. Next is DP 17-01.2, Northridge Subdivision, Phase 2. Paul, would you make the motion, please? As authorized by WDB 6.6.3, I, Paul Christensen, move that the Willison Development Review Board, having reviewed the application submitted and all the accompanying materials, including the recommendations of the town staff and the advisory boards required to comment on this application by the Wilson Development Bylaw, and having heard and duly considered the testimony presented at the public hearing of November 12, 2019, accept the recommendations proposed by staff for the review of DP 17-01.2 and authorize the applicant to proceed residential growth management allocation. Thank you. Do I have a second? I'll second it. Jill seconds it. Any further discussion? Shouldn't there be the word to? Yes. To yes. proceed to? Proceed yes. to? Yes. Yeah. Jill, do you still wish to second yes. it? <laughs> modification, of sure? course. <laughs> Any further discussion? No further discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 I, I will abstain. Six ayes, no nays, one abstention. Motion carries. <clears throat> Next is DP 13-04.2, Vermont Agency of Transportation, VTrans Park and Ride Facility, uh, it is 10.15, and this hearing is closed uh, at that point. Um, uh, John, would you like to make a motion, please? Sure. As authorized by WDB 6.6.3, I, John Hemmelgarn, move that the Wilson Development Review Board, having reviewed the application submitted and all accompanying materials, including the recommendations of the town staff and the advisory boards required to comment on this application by the Wilson Development Bylaw, and having heard and duly considered the testimony presented at the public hearing of November 12th, 2019, accept the findings of fact and conclusions of law proposed by staff for the review of the DP 13-04.2 and approve this discretionary permit subject to the conditions, um, the conditions of approval above. This approval authorizes the applicant to file final plans, obtain approval of these plans from staff and then seek an administrative permit for the proposed development, which must proceed in strict conformance with the plans on which this approval is based. And we're going to add two conditions, number 22, which reads, the applicant is to work with abutters to mitigate off-site impacts such as headlight pollution and nighttime construction and other noise pollution. All agreements reached shall be submitted to the town for incorporation into the conditions of approval and final plans. Uh, can we add all agreements reached with abutters? Yes. Would you reread that, please? Yep. Applicant is to work with abutters to mitigate off site impacts such as headlight pollution and nighttime construction and other noise pollution. All agreements reached with abutters shall be submitted to the town for incorporation into the conditions of approval and final plans. Great. Thank you. And uh, oh, Go ahead. And then we'll add uh, condition number 23. The applicant is to provide a dense mixture of trees in... Um, all right. Doubling. Here we go. Yeah. It's, it's, I've got a lot of arrows on this sheet here. <laughs> So the applicant is to provide a dense mixture of trees doubling the requirements of a type three informal planting buffer in the median between the access drive and St. George Road. Great. Do I have a second? I'll second it. Dave seconds it. Any further discussion? No further discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Seven ayes, no nays. Motion carries. Six ayes, no nays. nays. Oh, Motion carries. Second. One abstention. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the minutes of October 22? Um, who so would like to make a motion to uh, approve the minutes? Okay. So someone someone is going to make that motion with a caveat of? I, I'll make that motion. We approve these minutes as written with the caveat that staff verify the... Um, 
person, the, the, individual. the individuals making each of the, of the motions. And incorporate those into the final and approved minutes. Great. Uh, do I have a second? I'll second it. Pete seconds it. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, seven ayes, no nays, motion carries. Uh, do I have a motion to adjourn the meeting at 10.20? So moved. Thank you, everybody. That was good. <laughs>